Um, welcome to the Charlotte City Council July 27th Council Business Meeting. I want to call the meeting to order. Um, tonight's meeting is being held as a virtual meeting in accordance with the electronic meetings law and the requirements of notice, access, and minutes are being met through those means. Um, the public and the media are invited to watch us on, we are streaming Facebook Live, the city's YouTube page, or the city's government channel page. Um, I'd like to have us do our introductions. Our, after our introductions, um, Council Member Johnson will give our invocation for the night. Um, our invocation is intended to solemnize our proceedings and you may participate um, where if you wish or if you may. Um, then we will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be done, led by, or will be said by Council Member Malcolm Graham. So with that, um, I'm going to ask for introductions. I'm Vi Lyles, and I serve as mayor. Good evening. I'm Julie Isop. I serve as mayor pro tem in at large. Dimple Ashmera at large. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. James Mitchell at large. Jackson Winston at large. Happy Monday. Larkin Eggleston, District 1. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Good evening, Victoria Watlinson, District 3. Good evening, Renee Johnson, District 4. Good evening, Matt Newton, District 5. Tark McCarr, District 6. Ed Driggs, District 7. All right, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Lyles. Tonight, I want to briefly talk about the concept of servanthood. We know that it has many different meanings. Servanthood is often defined as the role of being a servant. A servant leader shares their power, puts the needs of others first, and helps people develop and perform as highly as possible. Servant leadership inverts the norm, which puts customer service as a main priority. Instead of people working to serve the leader, the leader exists to serve the people. We know many great examples of servant leadership. Today, we pay tribute to Mr. Robert Taylor, who was a wonderful servant for our city. We also let legendary civil dog. He was a man who should inspire the rest of us. Lead for the right reasons and be a moral compass. John Lewis understood servanthood and he lived by his principles. I also believe in the power of servanthood. I serve my God the family I love, and the people of Charlotte who trust their elected leadership. Thank you, Mayor. Somebody needs to mute. Mr. Graham? To allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Um, before we begin our public forum, I wanted to take a moment to um, read something that I received in the uh, mail over the weekend from the Carolina Asian American Chamber of Commerce. You know, we all work really hard, and sometimes I think we forget what it means because we've moved on to the next thing. So I'm going to read this letter I'm signed by John Chen, who is the chair, and Nimish Blatt, who is on the board of directors. Dear Mayor Lyles, we take this opportunity to congratulate the city's progress to date to facilitate the disbursement of SBA CARES Act loans. Many small business owners in our community of diverse ethnicity are benefiting from the financial relief received during this challenging time. For many reasons, not every owner in the Asian community are equipped or have access to, to resources to navigate the application process. Unfortunately, this is more pervasive among the underserved segment of our community, the refugee families, for instance. We're saddened and alarmed by the number of these families who have since moved out of the area to a state where they're getting help. When we first began our volunteer efforts to serve the community, we were so galvanized by the mission, scope, and participants' determination in groundbreaking crosswork Charlotte initiatives and the progress made towards an equitable, excessive, and inclusive city of in our, our inclusive city of Charlotte. 
the successful operate, cooperation and collaboration among government, business, and civic organizations is no doubt a major attribute that has elevated our city in particular to the top tier of domestic and international business direct destinations. Even with the city's growing reputation, we must work hard to ensure that the underserved have an opportunity to grow and thrive in a city they've been assigned to as their new home when they first arrive. We do feel that we need to pay a fraction of this goodwill back. And so there are comments in there that I think are gems that we all need to recognize. We do great work. There's more work to be done, but it is appreciated by our community. And so I just wanted to thank them for that letter and what they've sent to us. And so with that, um, I'm going to move to our public forum. And we have, let's see if I have the most current list, which is at 121, Madam Clerk. All right. So Ms. Jackson, to make sure that we've got everybody lined up because we'll be hearing them by over the um, internet. Um, I'm going to read the first two names. Um, Catherine Sexton, who will be followed by Glency Redrick. Ms. Sexton, they, I'm sorry, I should have said this. Um, I wanted to, Clark has reminded me that because we have 15 speakers and we will have, each speaker will have two minutes. So Ms. Sexton, you have two minutes and the timer will go off and um, when your two minutes are ended. All right, Ms. Sexton. All right. Hello. Hello, can, did you hear me? Yes, I did. I was just making sure y'all could hear me. Yes, we definitely can. Thank you for um, signing up. And if you will begin, you'll have two minutes for comment. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, thank you all for your service. Um, my name is Katie Sexton. I'm a web developer in Charlotte. Um, I just wanted to speak today about the Safe Com Communities Council and how I hope it continues and brings about actionable changes in Charlotte. Um, I know a lot of news media and timelines have moved on, but I do believe focusing on crime as a public health crisis and lack of resources issue instead of policing issue is the way forward. Um, it is my hope that the Safe Communities Council will also view the LA people's budget that can give an initial outline to put these divest in policing and invest in communities, housing and resources into practice for 2022's fiscal year and that the council has a large say in crafting that year's budget. Um, as Durham's Mayor Pro Tempore said, the safest communities don't have the most cops, they have the most resources. Um, and I yield my time. Thank you. Reverend Redrick? Yes, <clears throat> good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for honoring our presence this afternoon. I'm here on behalf of the clergy with our call to response um, for police uh, reimagining. And so we're looking at four different things. Representation, the absence of public involvement in the selection of a police chief. Uh, we feel that it should have community input. Reversal, the growing uh, use of military tactic, equipment, and training to handle law enforcement. We'd like to see that um, change. And to review, an immediate review of qualified immunity for officers involved shooting. So we'd like to be able to state to the body tonight that we are standing firm on the 16 demands that we presented to the city council to reimagine our city, a city one of a beloved community. And I yield my time. Thank you very much, Reverend Redrick. Um, Ms. Tina Castanos, Ms. Castanos. Can you hear me? Yes. Charlotte Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, proclamation declaring current governing policing and corporate systems a public health crisis. Whereas several Mecklenburg County climate activists have identified the ineffectuality of our current systems, government, police, and corporations to engender equity in our communities, systems that have instead reified white supremacy for over 400 years. And whereas racism, including environmental racism, will and cannot be properly mitigated within the current for-profit systems and will require direct action, systems change, and the turning of the collective consciousness. And whereas the long overdue revolution is underway, and it's the duty of our public servants to recognize and promote the great turning. And whereas criminal corporate practices have caused deep disparities, harm, and mistrust as these practices commodify the land, air, and water and engender social illness within communities of color. And whereas city and county officials are complicit 
and corporate criminality in their compliance and silence with corporate entities, most notably Duke Energy, whereas the city of Charlotte has stated in a January 16, 2019, memorandum of understanding with Duke Energy, quote, for more than 100 years, Charlotte and Duke Energy have enjoyed a strong tradition of working together, fostering Charlotte's growth, development, planning, and energy needs and objectives, unquote. Whereas this century-old marriage fostered growth, development, planning that benefited the few and ultimately harms and displaces people of color. Whereas the city and county continue their compliance and silence with a systemically corrupt police and jail system. Whereas the city addressed the militarized police forces which accosted and terrorized our citizens for enacting their civic responsibility to exercise their First Amendment rights by awarding police armies the biggest slice of the pie from the city budget, 40.4%. And whereas the public servant, Chief Kirputney, who ordered a guerrilla-style ambush on the citizens of this city, has yet to be arrested for this act of terrorism. And whereas the public servant, Tariq Bokhari, is a racist and whose company under his leadership should not be allowed to under contract the city to train vulnerable black and brown people in our communities. And now, therefore, let it be resolved. Ms. Castano, thank you very much for your time is up. And if you would submit the remainder of your remarks to the, um, our city clerk by email, we will certainly include the um, complete um, resolution in our records. Um, thank you very much. Um, Tisha London. Ms. London, I believe it's not, um, she's not signed in, so we will go to the next um, person on our list. Reverend Mack, Corinne Mack. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to speak for the council today. The NWSP has 111 years of advocating on behalf of black and brown and poor people, and we continue to do so today. Specifically, we've been advocating for equity for 111 years. In this country as well, as today, we are advocating in the city of Charlotte. There are four components that we are interested in ensuring happens here in Charlotte. Um, although we're happy to hear about the Asian American community's uh, uh, feelings regarding equity, black people don't feel the same way. Four compon components will be um, having specific conversations and, in fact, the commission set up for restorative justice. Having a harm-free zone um, organized throughout the city, specifically in the areas that have had um, high um, levels of crime and high levels of violence of late. A community engagement hub, something that's been done all over the country and has worked where financing has happened so that the actual community organizers and community organizations are actually receiving the funds to do the specific work because we are the ones on the ground. And lastly, that there is some level of conversation that happens, that there is community input uh, throughout every aspect of work being done through the city, uh, which means there would have to be uh, a higher level of transparency, something that we are concerned about, have been concerned about for some, some time. Lastly, we are deeply concerned about the possible violation of the North Carolina Constitution, Article 1, Sections 32 and 33, as it pertains to the Carolina FinTech um, decision of $1.5 million. So we are happy that there's some, some level of conversation around um, creating jobs for people of color. It's more important that people of color, specifically black people, are leading this conversation and receiving the funding to do the actual work. Thank you very Thank much, you so much, Reverend Mack. So if you Thank would you have so the, complete your remarks or send a copy to the clerk's office, we will include them in the record. The next speaker is Giselle Vernick Salgado. Ms. Salgado? Yes, can you hear me? We can. Thank you. If you have two minutes. At 4 a.m. on June 6th, I had a panic attack. For the previous two weeks, I worked anywhere between 8 to 16 hour shifts as a street medic. I handed out water, charged phones, picked up food, bandaged cuts, delivered masks and gloves to protesters around the city. I was often followed by police while doing this work. On June 3rd, Martin Luther King Boulevard, police trapped us, tear gas, pepper sprayed and shot rubber bullet and pepper bullets at us, all while I was inside my car, clearly marked as a medic, full of water bottles and masks. This got national attention from the media reporting CMPD's behaviors are absolutely evil. Martin Luther King Boulevard, by the way, where I drove two people released from jail to their cars parked in the street, where I was routinely supported by scowling motorcycle cops blocking my way towards the protest where water and food was needed. 
There are dozens and dozens of protesters who had their backpack straps cut while they were detained in jail. Thousands and thousands of dollars of destroyed photo equipment, cell phones, and other valuables. Then there were two tow trucks following me, headlight flashing, tailgating me behind an empty I-77. On June 5th, I stopped to hand out water and was promptly greeted by two F-250s loaded with about 10 riot policemen each, armed to the teeth, smirking at me as they drove my car. That night, I could only remember the scenes of kids being hurt, of small frame women being snatched and thrown into cars violently, of clergy and elderly members of our city being choked out by the gas in the streets, the homeless folks being beat by cops on bikes. I had a panic attack on June 6th after two weeks of working as a street medic and being repressed by police. I spent one week in the hospital. I was diagnosed with PTSD and now have over $8,000 in bills because I was a concerned citizen who decided to help my fellow neighbors in the fight against CMPD. Helicopters overhead drive me into a panic. The smell of tear gas nearly induces a seizure. Why are we doing this to our neighbors? That's what I ask you. Why did my district representative vote for 400 extra million in gear for these thugs to terrorize us? Why do we have new cameras on that the homeless men tell me have been surveilling them on the Woodlawn South? Thank you very much, Ms. Saldak-Gaga. If you would just send the remainder of your remarks to um, the city clerk, we would appreciate that. Um, Whitney Jackson. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? We can. Please begin your two minutes for comment. Certainly. I appreciate the time, and thank you for being so prompt to get back to me to be part of this this evening. While unable to assemble to worship freely right now because of the coronavirus and having some restrictions on that, protests have continued in large groups. And I'm very thankful for the police officers who put their lives on the line to look out for us understand there's a lot of controversy surrounding that, but I do support our police department and believe that the budget should actually be increased so that they have the right tools, the right training, and the right coverage to be able to take care of us. And I'd like to know if that's something that will be worked with. Secondly, I believe it's a capricious decision recently to remove bar seating from our restaurants who have only just begun to get back on their feet again, where you can certainly have six feet apart in many of these local restaurants. And this has hurt many of my friends who are entrepreneurs, and I would like to see us remove that capricious act most recently. So those are my two points, and I appreciate your time in speaking to them. Thank you very much, Ms. Jackson. Um, the next speaker is Caitlin Reitman Osman. Ms. Reitman Osman. Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, please go ahead and begin with your um, comments. Okay, thank you. Hello, city council members. Uh, my name is Caitlin. I grew up in Charlotte, and now I work in the mental health community here. Like many others, uh, I am speaking today in support of divesting from policing and investing into communities. People do not trust the police. <laughs> And unfortunately, no amount of raising reward money or funding police-run youth programs is going to change that. The problem with CMPD is not just their liberal use of chemical weapons. It's bigger than them. It's that policing, criminalization, and incarceration is the default response to all of our societal issues. We know that police practices are built on a foundation laid in protecting white supremacy and the interests of the wealthy. You said you want to reimagine policing and use evidence-based practice, so we have to look critically at the systems in place. And as our elected representatives, I'm asking you to not just say that you hear us, but to listen to the people on the ground in the communities you're discussing and bravely embrace a transformative mindset. This is going to require hard, uncomfortable conversations. We have to acknowledge you work with police. You listen to their reports regularly. So it's probably hard for you to separate their perceived function from their actual harmful impact, which is why I think we need a few things. One, we need to have an independent audit of the CMPD budget. Charlotte residents should be able to see from an unbiased perspective where our tax money is going and how it could be better used. Two, we need to directly invest money into health and relief and grassroots community organizations that are already doing this work and not just the ones with the big budgets and nonprofit status. And three, I think we need to limit the contact the police have with the public. Support ideas like Councilman Winston's and where we can improve our response to 911 calls by creating this dispatch system of appropriate first responders. As of right now, our response to harm is a punitive, violent, and one-size-fits-all approach, and it's not working. This process of transformation will be uncomfortable, but as Cass Otley recently said in a Gantt Center pa panel, uh, change does not happen when you are uncomfortable or when you are comfortable. 
And so if you can't handle that discomfort and enact the changes we need, then we'll kill our president. Thank you very much for your remarks, Ms. Reitman, Houseman, um, Osman. Um, please feel free to send the remainder of your remarks to the city clerk. Um, we have two speakers. One is indicated, Ms. Howie has indicated that she does not wish to speak. And um, I believe that Ms. <coughs> Prophet does also not wish to speak. <coughs> so council members, those two persons are, um, have requested not to comment. The next speaker that we have is Joel Siegel. Mr. Siegel. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Honorable Mayor Vi Lyles and members of the City Council, my name is Joel Siegel, and tonight I'm speaking in support of the Restorative Justice Charlotte's Resolution on Racial Justice and Expedited Upward Mobility for Low-Income Black Communities that we, the majority of the people in Charlotte, would like to have introduced and passed unanimously in the Charlotte City Council with all deliberate speed. If Charlotte is to become a world-class city, a moral city, and as Dr. Willie Keaton of Queens College says, one city, not a tale of two cities, one for the comfortable and affluent, the other for low-income black residents who have little or no chance of getting out of so-called poverty, we must begin the much-needed discussion of what policies and programs that we can put forward in our city if we're gonna move forward in breaking this revolving door cycle of poverty. I want to conclude by saying that recent studies have shown that Charlotte is ranked 50 out of 50 cities in upward mobility. In our resolution, and we really look forward to working with you as partners, because you are, are a progressive city council, one of the most important aspects of the resolution is to adopt the aspirational goal that the Charlotte City Council will actively work for Charlotte to become number one in upward mobility for low-income black residents and not last. This was the right thing to do. As someone who worked for Representative John Lewis for 13 years in the U.S. Congress, this is in the spirit of John Lewis and John Conyers. God bless everybody. It's time for a new Charlotte, and we can get there, but we can't do it unless we do it together in the spirit of Martin Luther King's beloved community. God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Siegel. Our next speaker is Jennifer Roberts. Mayor Roberts. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Terrific. Good to see everybody. And thanks for letting me speak. I am speaking also in support of a Charlotte restorative justice resolution for atonement reconciliation reparations for a history of redlining, divesting, and marginalizing communities of color, and specifically African Americans and Black Americans. I've heard from hundreds of residents who support this as well. Many of you know the history of urban renewal in Charlotte in the 60s when Brooklyn Village was demolished. 216 black owned businesses were forced to relocate. Many were destroyed. Churches, neighborhood schools, and residences were demolished to make way for government buildings. And African Americans were robbed of their businesses, places of worship. And as we know through the Chetty study just mentioned, their access to opportunity. So the Stan Greenspawn Center for Peace and Social Justice has been working along with numerous folks in the community on the concept of reconciliation and restoration with support from numerous leaders and organizations in our community. Charlotte needs to formally admit wrongdoing and apologize, but in order to atone, they also need a plan to rebuild, restore, and repair what was done. Several cities in the U.S. have begun this process, Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. The community also recognizes that racial justice and healing needs to go beyond policing and criminal justice. Although it was police brutality and the death of George Floyd that ignited our recognition of racism, a re-recognition, um, racism is also intertwined with our housing policies, zoning, infrastructure, contracting, employment, education, healthcare, and other aspects. There's so much work ahead, but it starts with admission an apology, a recognition of harm done, and a goal to put resources into reconciliation and repair. It would be great to have this focus on the Brooklyn Village area. It would get national attention. It would mean so much to the people in this community. I call on Charlotte Business to join this process, admit that they also have made money off of African Americans deprived of their property, barred from employment, charged higher lending rates. Mayor, you know this is hard to do to say. Mayor, uh, your, your time is up. Time. So I'm just, yeah, I appreciate your time. I'll uh, thank send you. the rest of my comments in. Thank Thanks you so very much, you much Mayor. Right. All right. Um, next is um, Jay Jackson, Ms. Jackson. Hello, uh, good evening. 
I come to you as a concerned citizen. I have now have three questions for you. I'd like to see a show of hands. How many of us in this meeting think that it's okay for the city council member to create a conflict of interest and to commit a crime? I show of hands. How many of us think that it's okay for city council to cover up the crime? Show of hands. Finally, how many of us think that a city council member that creates a conflict of interest and commits a crime that it should be exposed to the citizens of Charlotte that have a right to be informed about it. When we look at uh, Article 4, Section 8, 1.01, um, it shows that any person or persons violating this provision shall be guilty of a Class 1 misdemeanor. Based off a report we saw on WBTV on July 22nd, Councilman Bakari's nonprofit Carolina Fintech Hub may have done just that. Therefore, not allowing the citizens of Charlotte to have the same opportunity, especially minority business owners, who among us were afforded the opportunity to one of these lucky positions, any skilled people need, any minorities, who selected these individuals. City council members are selected by and elected by the people to serve the people, not their own self-interest. At this point, we the concerned citizens demand that we open up an investigation tonight and vote on an investigation tonight. If the, Mr. McCarry is found innocent, he should be exonerated. If he's Thank found you very guilty, much, Ms. Jackson. If you'll send charged. the remainder of your remarks to the city clerk. Oh, I'm sorry. That was, what was that? Oh, my apologies. I heard the bell ring and it wasn't from the clerk's office. So how long does she have? All right, Ms. Jackson, you have 25 additional sec seconds. I heard the bell, and it wasn't the the bell did not toll for thee. If Mr. McCarr is found innocent, he should be exonerated. If found with his hand caught in the cookie jar, then charges must be brought against him. Again, do we cover up a crime, or do we expose it as it is? Again, I do demand that the city council vote tonight on opening an investigation. Thank you. I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you very much, Ms. Jackson. The next speaker is Dr. Willie J. Keaton. Dr. Keaton? Dr. Keaton? Is he signed? Is he not? We're checking in to see if. Are you on mute, Dr. Keaton? All right, we'll um, continue. Um, Rabbi Judy Schindler, I'm sorry. Mr. Keaton? All right, we'll go to the next speaker and come back while we can check on the technology for Dr. Keaton. Um, Rabbi Schindler? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Oh. All right. First of all, thank you for removing the Judah Benjamin Memorial from Tron Street. I and the Jewish community are really deeply appreciative of your work. I speak tonight on the Charlotte Black Upward Mobility and Restorative Justice Resolution that we hope you will unanimously pass. In the midst of the COVID pandemic, we've become painfully aware of the pandemic of racism that is killing black Charlotteans. Slavery, Jim Crow, redlining the demolition of the Brooklyn neighborhood has left our black siblings far more vulnerable <laughs> to the health and economic storms that come our way. In January of 1960, Charlotte City Council members voted to cash in on urban renewal funds and to dismantle Brooklyn. A black community was destroyed and a jail and courthouse was built in its place. My friends on the city council, please make the righting of historic wrongs a priority that has held, that wrong has held our black siblings down. We have socially, economically, educationally distanced them. In Judaism, righting wrongs is a three-step process. First, we apologize. Secondly, we make restitution to repair the harm caused. And third, we don't do it again. We call on that same three-step process, not just from you, but from the faith, business, philanthropic communities, from other civic leaders, from those who benefited from Charlotte's historic practices of racism. We seek an apology from you as representatives of our city. We seek restitution. We will be setting up, we hope to set up a restorative justice fund that will invest in black upward mobility in six areas of harm caused, business development, mental health, education, land ownership, re-entry. Funds to support this can be raised from budgeting, from creating tax districts. We seek systemic change, a process of ensuring community benefits agreements from developers, 
ensuring opportunities for the computer community as they create opportunities for themselves. How will it happen with investment, civic, business, philanthropic, organizational, religious, individual? Rabbi, Rabbi, um, if you'll you. finish your remarks or send them into the clerk's office. Um, I have heard and had a conversation with both Rabbi Schindler and Dr. Keaton and have agreed to put the um, resolution or statement around our efforts on this on the August 10th agenda. So with that, that concludes our um, public speakers list. Um, do, we, do we have Dr. Keaton? We, he's not there. He's, he's not on there, so, um, or not able. He has a sign or called in. So with that, um, that completes our public forum. Um, next we go to the public hearings. Um, so the, I'm sorry, the consent agenda. Um, so Mr. Jones, I think the staff completed or mailed out questions. Are there any items to be removed by the staff from the consent agenda? Madam Clerk? All right, so this, um, are there any items that council members would like to um, exclude from the um, consent agenda for a separate vote? Uh, uh, yes, Madam Mayor, this is Council Member Newton. Uh -huh. I would at 29 be pulled for comments and separate vote. All right, item 29 for a separate vote. Are there any others from the council for a separate vote? Are there any for, uh, bef all right, we'll go ahead and make our motion to. Um, motion to approve. We have a second. For items 20 through 36, with the exception of 29, um, is, I have a second. motion. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, um, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Is there anyone that objects to the motion? Hearing no objection, the motion passes unanimously. So we now go to item 29 in the book. Um, it is item 29. It is bond issuance approval for Albemarle Landing Adopter Resolution granting in Livian's request to issue multifamily housing revenue bonds in an amount not to exceed $14 million to finance the development of an affordable housing development known as Albemarle Landing. Motion to approve. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a motion. Do I have second. a second? We have a second. second. All right. Is there any discussion? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. All right. Mr. Newton. Yes, thank you, uh, Mick, for, uh, for, for that. Uh, this is a proposed, uh, this is a, a bond proposal for development on uh, the Albemarle Road corridor. Uh, in the heart of what constitutes the business district uh, for District 5 and the southern portion of East Sharp. Uh, this is the site that used to be, so for anyone familiar with, uh, with that corridor, this is the site that used to be the old Upton site, uh, the old Upton's department store. Uh, so uh, it, at one point, much like uh, the corridor as a whole, uh, was a, a business, so a thriving business center. Uh, what is uh, supported this bond is the placement of residential, uh, so uh, multifamily, two hundred, well, I guess 128 multifamily units uh, on that uh, B2 zoned site. Uh, I think that, um, so uh, for me and for the community, uh, we have looked forward uh, for uh, well over a decade now to the business, uh, to the revitalization of the corridor uh, for, for business purposes. Uh, the area itself uh, has uh, some of, if not the highest, population density in all of the city of Charlotte, uh, lowest incomes, and at the same time, uh, the fewest jobs. Uh, I, I think that that given the circumstances here, um, and, I, and I've had discussions with the developer uh, that started about a year ago, uh, expressed uh, my concern with uh, with taking a, a parcel that's on the, the frontage of Albemarle, uh, and uh, that it is zoned for business and commercial use and uh, placing exclusive residential there um, without uh, any uh, accommodations for commercial or retail. Uh, and uh, doing that knowing full well that the, the vision for the area uh, would include that commercial uh, use, 
Uh, in fact, the land use plan calls for retail on the uh, on the parcel uh, exclusively. Uh, in fact, on the parcel. Now, I think it's it's bare. It, it's it's worth noting. Uh, so it bears noting that that this is an affordable housing development. I fully appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate the fact that that we uh, we are, are acting deliberately uh, to to increase our affordable housing stock within the city of Charlotte, and we need to do that uh, because. Uh, that need exists, but I also think that uh, that we need to be intentional uh, in in what we do and approve. And in this instance, uh, this is a corridor much like uh, the Beatty's Ford Road corridor that's in need of business revitalization, in need of the creation of jobs for uh, for local residents uh, that don't currently exist. I I had a good conversation with uh, uh, with uh, with one of you with uh, with one of our colleagues about this and. Uh, uh, it was mentioned that this is, you know, for, for East Charlotte and for the folks uh, in District 5, you know, this is our, our, our park place, uh, our park place, our boardwalk. Uh, and uh, we would like to see the type of revitalization that lends itself to that and uh, not residential on this particular parcel on the frontage of Albemarle Road. So uh, those are my concerns. I will be voting against this for that reason. Uh, because it does deprive the area, uh, not just of the potential for business, but business zoning altogether uh, in exchange for something that is abundantly uh, already in existence right there uh, within the area, which is, which is residential. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, I'll call for the vote I now. I my hand up. I'm sorry. Who, who is Martin. that? All right, Mr. Eggleston. Yeah, I just wanted to um, understand Mr. Newton's comments, but just wanted to remind everybody that this is an opportunity for 128 workforce housing units uh, where they have not made an ask of our housing trust fund. And so I think uh, we have got to think very seriously uh, anytime there's an opportunity for us to move forward on some of our affordable housing goals, and particularly when we are not being asked to dip into our limited pool of resources to do so. Uh, I think we have to take that very seriously, and particularly given the investment that is coming to this corridor around Eastland with the investments that uh, Tepper Sports will be making, the investments that we just talked about in the TAP meeting today uh, around the, the Silver Line that will be coming uh, not too far from this site. So the access to uh, grocery stores, retail that's in this corridor, and the future investments in transit and Eastland, um, I think we've got to get ahead of the gentrification. And as someone who represents a district not far from here uh, that has seen that, if you wait until the housing becomes unaffordable to try to create affordability, uh, it's too late at that point. So I think we're getting ahead of it. Uh, and knowing the investments we're making, this area will not be as affordable as it is now, five years from now. So um, appreciative of Olivia and Livian being ahead of the curve on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, if, if, you're, if the council is prepared, I'll go ahead and begin the roster. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Ms. Johnson? Yes. M Mr. Newton? Mr. Newton? No. I, I think I heard, I can see you saying that. No, now, now. now. Um, Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Uh, is there anyone that uh, would like to oppose this motion? No, um, our vote totals are in. We have nine. Does anyone wish to oppose this motion? If not, the motion passes with one person being in opposition. All right, so after we, um, we now go to our public hearings. Um, we have four public hearings. Um, item number five, if you would um, find that on your agenda. Let me find it on my agenda. All right, item number five is a public hearing for Centene Corporation Business Investment Grant um, regarding the approval of a business investment grant to Centene Corporation. Um, the um, investment grant would be um, an amount requiring that they, which would include the city council approval 
of not to exceed over $31 million over 12 years. Mecklenburg County and the state would also be um, contributors to this investment program, this new relocation. Are there any pe people signed up to speak on the public hearing? There is no one signed up to speak. Um, close the hearing. We have a motion Second. to close the public hearing. And um, so if we can proceed for the, is there any discussion on closing the public hearing? Hearing no discussion, um, Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Is there anyone that objects to the closing of the public hearing? Hearing no objection, that motion passes unanimously. The next hey, public, have, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I have my I have my hands up. I, I oh. wanted to ask a question, and, and if this is the time, if not the time, you can let me know. No, you is certainly it, take. I, I'm assuming that you can ask a question. It's on the agenda. Um, okay. What's your question? I wanted to ask: Is there any requirement for minority contractors um, in the development of the um, the construction for Centene? Can we send that to you so that we can make sure, as I recall, there are a lot of things that they're contributing um, and okay. participating in. So we'll get that information on whether what the goal is for the minority and women in business owned participation in the project from the um, company. So we'll okay. put that on the follow up list. Ms. Harris, did you get that one? All right. So with that, um, we have closed that public hearing. The next um, public hearing is a public hearing on, I'm sorry. Ms. May Mayor Pro Tem? I did. Is this for the vote? Um, yeah, I was about to start the vote I'm on the next item, item six. The next public hearing. It, the other one passed unanimously. Okay. Okay. So item number six, a public hearing on Cameron Common Area Voluntary Annexation. Um, so this petition um, has been received from the owner of the 95 acres, Samuel Johnson, James Johnson, and K. Saad, Sade Ventures. Um, so with, um, are there any people? We do have a speaker. Who is the speaker? Um, Mr. Schaefer is signed up to speak. Mr. Ty Schaefer. Hi, yes. Uh, only if there are any questions from council, I'm here to answer them. All right, so are there questions for council or any discussion on the public hearing on the voluntary annexation of Cameron Cowman's area? All right, did I have a motion to close the public hearing? Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, we'll start, Mayor Pro Tem, on the motion to close. Yes. Ms. Esmira? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. All right, thank you. We're getting feedback. There's someone that's not muting, and the other one, there's a there's someone computer that's ringing a bell that makes me think that the clerk is asking for people to stop, and it's if you guys could just check that, that would be great. That would be very helpful. The next public hearing is on the Carson Glen area voluntary annexation for approximately 21 acres. The property is owned by Robert Farrell, Caritha Farrell, Lewis Woods, and Marlene Woods. Um, do we have any speakers, Madam Clerk? No speakers are signed up. Do we have any comments or s from the council? Move Here, to close. We have second. a motion to close and a second. Second. All right. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Is there anyone opposing the motion to close? Hearing that, that motion passes unanimously. The next public hearing is on McGee Place, it's an area, McGee Place area voluntary annexation. There's not a speaker signed up. So with that, this petition is from the owner of 20 acres. The owner is Judson Stringfellow. Um, is there any question or comment from the council? Move to close. We have a motion to close and a second. 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 Thank you all in favor. Is there any discussion? All in favor of the motion to close, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? 
Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Okay. Um, is there anyone who opposes this motion? Hearing no one, no one in opposition, we will um, go ahead and it's, that motion passes unanimously. All right, so that covers our consent items, the public forum, as well as our public hearings. We'll now go to the city policy agenda. Um, we do have a closed session at the end of the meeting, so I just want to remind folks that we will be in a closed session towards the end of the meeting. All right, so the first item that we have on our um, city manager's report, I will turn it over to him, and we'll begin. Okay, thank you, Mayor and members of council. Tonight we have uh, four items under the city manager's report. The first is um, the COVID-19 update, and that's the city response and recovery. Uh, there were some items that were asked of uh, me um, late last week that will fall under that um, particular category. And then we have some updates. Uh, I'm excited that we'll have Taiwo and company tonight to talk about the transportation and transit updates. Uh, we have our, our strategic energy action plan and the American Cities Climate Challenge update. Again, good news. And then something that's near and dear to uh, Council Member Mitchell's heart, that is the update on the um, Charlotte Business Inclusion, the annual report. So we'll um, have that with a special announcement at the end of that uh, report. So, Mayor, unless there are questions for me, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Chief Johnson to give us an update. All right, Chief Johnson, you're up. Good evening, Mayor and Council, Reginald Johnson, Fire Chief. I'm accompanied tonight with uh, Deputy Director of Emergency Management, Battalion Chief White Graham, and he'll provide some uh, update details as well. Uh, I'll start off with just some of our numbers from COVID. Uh, today is day 138 of our EOC activation. We are one of 35 EOCs activated within the state. Eighth number of positive cases as of noon today was 19,284. Number of deaths as of noon today was 189. Globally, we've had uh, 16,340,000 cases, 650,000 deaths. Nationally, 4.3 million cases, 147,000 deaths. In the county, we have 36 Congress sites which contain an outbreak. Remember, outbreak status is defined as three or more positive cases in a congregate living location. Just wanted to give you an update on that. Uh, I'll let Chief Graham go into more detail, but we also have to remember that emergency management is all about all the risks and hazards that the county and the city face. Uh, the EOC is monitoring weather and the tropics been very active over the past several days. Uh, this year we got to the letter G, Gonzalo, uh, and that's the fastest we've ever gotten to the letter G. Uh, that says a little something, especially since we just had Tropical Storm Hannah just hit Texas, uh, which brought to light some concerns that we're reviewing in the EOC where they actually had hospitals that were slightly flooded and had to uh, work on how to transport COVID positive patients from that hospital. So there's some more food for thought for our, our workers. Uh, North Carolina North Carolina National Guard is transitioning uh, to more of a response for the hurricane season. And we are currently watching one uh, wave that is coming, uh, which has a 90% uh, probability of forming. Uh, a lot of the models have it coming towards the, the states uh, in the Southeast, but we'll continue to watch that over the next few days. Chief Graham. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, as of this morning, I actually meant to check this out and get on here, but uh, unemployment benefits were scheduled to run out on Friday, or are scheduled to run out on Friday, July 31st. Congress is working on uh, rectifying the situation. However, if they do not, it will uh, cause increase on our resources, on our uh, BOAD and our all the different activities we have uh, going on in the county. 
Uh, emergency management has been working with Mecklenburg County and the Sheltering Task Force to uh, open cooling centers. And they did so last week and over the weekend at the Men's Shelter of Charlotte and uh, also today and tomorrow. Those cooling centers will close uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. as the heat index uh, drops below the uh, uh, 100 degree mark. Countywide mask distribution plan, the coordinated mask distribution effort continues this week using GIS products to monitor mask requests and track distribution targeting vulnerable and high risk populations. Over 450,000 masks have been distributed to date. The Emergency Operations Center continues to monitor a number of indicators from both hospitals related to COVID-19 and put all those numbers together on a daily basis. And so we have a good situation awareness of how the hospitals, uh, how full they are and how they're operating. Any questions that we have at all, Atrium and Novant are in the Emergency Operations Center and are very helpful partners in maintaining situation awareness and solving uh, problems throughout the county. Working with the volunteer organizations acting disasters, the VOAD, uh, to address the issue of, we found out just before we came here, there are 363 foster children in need of families. The families that would normally take them in cannot do so, or have indicated they cannot do so due to the virtual learning uh, schedule that CMS has set up. That system is, is under significant strain, and so we're working with social services and other VOAD uh, groups to uh, help mitigate that issue. To date, and I find this number very interesting, 17,000 unique volunteers have worked on COVID-related activities throughout the county. And as of July 22nd, 3,654,572 meals have been distributed throughout the county. Mecklenburg County, with the assistance from the Emergency Operations Center, continues to maintain hotels for isolation and quarantine for the general public and social distancing hotel options in response to overflow at homeless shelters. The Mecklenburg County uh, Board of Elections has been added to the policy group that meets Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings, and CMEMO and the Emergency Operations Center are working to ensure the election process is successful. And finally, the new Emergency Operations Center opened uh, just today. They moved uh, Thursday and Friday. So the first time in our history, in our county history, Mecklenburg County has had what is called a hot EOC. In other words, we walk right in, we turn, put the switch, and everything is live and ready to go. It represents a significant benchmark in Charlotte and Mecklenburg's preparedness for major emergencies and disasters. And that's all we have this evening, Chief Johnson. Here for questions, Mayor. I have a question, Madam Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Chief, thank you for the information. Yeah. All right. Could you hear? I couldn't hear you, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. Can you hear me, Chief? I can hear you. Okay. Um, with regards to the cooling shelters, the cooling stations, 100 degrees is the cutoff. If it goes below 100, you turn these off. Or you... So we have a sheltering task force that uh, includes the emergency management, includes city, county resources, Red Cross, and other volunteer mm -hmm organizations, non-government organizations. And that sheltering task force meets every month uh, to address homelessness and other concerns. And one of the things that they address working with the county is um, having a trigger point for our cooling centers. And the cooling centers, I believe uh, it's heat index, which is 100 degrees is when the decision's made to open um, cooling centers. Okay, it just seems hot. <laughs> 99 degrees seems really hot still. Is there, uh, is this, I mean, what other cities are doing or it just still seems like above 90 degrees, 90 degrees is really hot. Well, we can look and try to get some, sorry. We can 
try to get some comparison numbers as far as what other uh, cities here in North Carolina do, uh, our size, uh, but that is a number that uh, was determined through the sheltering task force uh, with a number of experts on that, on that task force. Uh, okay, I'd just like to ask, I mean, I know a lot of people put thought into this, but I'd like to ask if they would consider that or what the implications are, um, why it would be difficult to do that. But, it, you know, it, it's still pretty hot out there. Anything in the 90s is hot. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. All right, Council Member Mitchell. Mayor, thank you. Chief Johnson, uh, thank you for that report, sir. But uh, that me, there's a rumor being circulated that CMPD is going to take some action on August 5th to remove uh, individuals from the tent community. Uh, and I've been kind of confused because I thought that was personal property. Uh, can you share with council, uh, you know, about this situation, please, sir? We have Captain Brian Koch on the line to address that. Um, if Wendy, if you could get him set up to speak. Thank you, Marie. I'm, uh, this is Captain Koch. Uh, I'm, I'm on. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Captain. Oh, fantastic. Oh. Well, I, I, I appreciate sure everybody. I wasn't sure who Captain Koch was, Brad. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's me. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I am the uh, uh, captain over the Central Division, which encompasses uh, the area primarily at uh, 12th and College and uh, 12th and Graham, where we have a large homeless population. And uh, it I, I'm not quite sure, uh, Councilman Mitchell, where that came from, that, um, you know, kind of the rumor that as of August 1st, we were going to be going in there and clearing that out. Uh, similar to other private businesses, uh, the, the policy of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department is to ensure, um, you know, if that, if that business wants people to leave, it's our job to assist that and help facilitate that based on a private uh, private residence or private business or private property. But at this point, uh, with those two locations and those two pieces of private property, um, we have worked with the management and the owners and uh, there is uh, no, um, I guess there's not an appetite at this point to uh, have uh, move forward with uh, assisting with the removal of uh, the individuals at those locations there. So that's uh, a false rumor. Thank you, Captain Kosh. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Are there any other questions for the Chief? Ms. Ajmira? Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So Mayor Pro Tem raised a good point about it's really hard out there. So regardless of what other cities are doing, we should not be following. We should be taking a lead. Um, when we have really hot temperatures out there and we have folks that are struggling in the middle of this pandemic. So I would like us to take a lead and not just follow what other cities are doing. Uh, so Mayor Pro Tem, thank you for raising that. To the point, I'm not asking us to do what other cities are doing. I just wondered why they came up with 100 degrees and, you know, it, can't we do better than that? Why? I'd like to know, there's always work that goes into these things. I'd just like to know what that is as well. All right, um, Mr. Winston. Um, yes, I, I'd like to um, talk about, I guess, maybe an elephant in the room, quite literally, uh, the RNC. Uh, we learned within the past week uh, that due to the COVID pandemic, uh, that uh, the only place that efforts would be happening is here in Charlotte. Um, I understand our official position um, in terms of preparing um, that we are not spending any more money, um, but I, I, I think we have to use a bit of common sense here. Um, I'm just wondering what our thought process is um, in terms of dealing uh, with uh, the potential for more people uh, than we expected coming um, into our city for a mass event um, in the next month. Uh, so if, if we can have kind of general thoughts in terms of um, can we come? Can we come back? Can we come back to that after we um, get? I think Ms. Johnson, Councilmember Johnson, had a question specifically around the report on the um, on the homeless thing. So we can come okay. back to the RNC 
at the but let's if, I just want to make sure council member Johnson did you want to talk about the homeless situation or I, I just wanted to um, I just did wanted to um, um, uh, make it clear my question it was in relation to the, the COVID aspect of, of mass gathering not mass, not sim not just uh, logistical portions of it okay got it yes we can we can come back to that council member Johnson thank you mayor I have a question regarding the um, the the rumor I guess of the displacement regarding the individuals in tent city so I believe we received some information that there was uh, that there was a request by property owners that those individuals be moved. So I want to know if that's changed or if the city manager can can, can speak to that. So uh, thank you, Councilmember Johnson, and hopefully Brad is still on the line. I think yes, sir, I'm um, here. Okay, awesome. I think there are are, are two things, and Brad, I'll let you deal with whether or not there was a, a bona fide request to, to move folks. I, um, one thing that uh, the captain mentioned was that when there is a private property and a private owner on private property calls to have um, someone removed, that that is what CMPD would uh, interface. I know that Council Member Winston in the past has brought up the issue of CDC guidelines and um, what is the you know the untended consequence or the negative impact of let's say breaking up one of these camps? So um, all of that is taken into consideration. But um, specifically, Brad, I would ask you if, if there was some intel that initially or a request that was initially made to um, remove the camp. I think that's your question. Yeah, uh, Mr. Jones and, and Councilwoman Johnson, uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, the um, I think that there was a it was probably a discussion in um, not not a firm discussion, more a hypothetical question. Um, and you, you know, we have been in contact with uh, the owners of both properties. And um, it, it, I mean, unequivocally, it, it, there's no point uh, and there's no, uh, I, I think it's, it's not going to last in perpetuity. I think at some point, you know, that they're going to want to um, ask, you know, kind of reclaim their property. Uh, but in the near future, that is, that is not going to happen. So uh, whether or not the, the business owners had a change of heart, um, you know, that's something that probably only they could speak to, but in terms of anything that, that has changed with our policy in regard to how we, you know, handle, um, you know, individuals on private property, that's that's not changed at all. I, and I hope that answers your question. So if the business owner, because I, I, I've seen a letter, I just can't find it right now. There, there was think some request or some discussion about it. So if the business owner does at some point decide um, that they would want the individuals to move, what, what, how, how much notice would they be given or what would be the process or what would be CMPD's role in that? Well, our, our role would be similar to if someone at a convenience store or um, movie theater or something like that or uh, department store wanted an individual to leave the property. Um, it's incumbent on the person who either the, the property owner or the property manager to go and ask the individuals to leave. And then they would be given an opportunity to leave. And we will certainly work to facilitate to make sure that there is, you know, if and when that happens, uh, to make sure that there is ample time and ample notice given to the individuals, and we are also working with, um, you know, the individuals at Roof, uh, uh, the leadership at Roof Above there, which is an integral part, uh, formerly the Urban Ministries uh, and the Men's Shelter. So we're in constant communication with them as well, and we'll help facilitate, um, you know, because at the end of the day, I mean, we do not uh, want to be in the business of you know, having to arrest people or, you know, take 
any sort of legal action, more to help facilitate, um, you know, the the movement, and uh, you know, uh, to make sure that they can have a place where they where they can go. All right, Mr. Jones. Uh, and yes, uh, so for our council member Johnson, we um, also, and I think we uh, talked about this maybe last month have an additional allocation of uh, $6.9 million um, from the federal government in uh, ESG funds. And those are specifically to help us uh, around the area of homelessness. I believe that that would be in um, the housing task force or soon to be in the um, Great Neighborhoods Committee. But again, there's a, a, a great opportunity for us to make a very positive impact in that area. All right, um, Ms. Watlington, do you want to ask a question on this topic as well? I just wanted to know who drew all the pictures behind Captain Coke. I'm sorry, I couldn't understand what you said. I wanted to know who drew the pictures in the background. Uh, oh, yeah, Captain Coke. He does have quite a nice yes. art collection, doesn't he? That thought, I was noticing that as well. All right. Those are, those are all, all, all my kids. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll make sure that they... Uh, I see one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, so, okay, yes, thank you very much, Captain. Um, yes, ma'am. Are there any other questions on the portion of the manager's report that he's provided for you, manager or the chiefs? All right, so what's next, Mr. Jones? I'm sorry. Well, well, okay, so. Um, do we want to go do the RNC next? Um, Mr. Winston asked a question earlier about the RNC and um, the information. Mr. Winston, you want to restate your question? Yes, I, I, given uh, the, the pivot uh, that the RNC has made over the past uh, week or so um, in relation to, to uh, stopping the Jacksonville portion of the convention, understanding that we have also kind of declared and stated that we're not doing any additional planning, um, but under the prospect of, of an, and using a common sense approach that things are, are changing and now that we are the only host city of this. How are we planning um, or, or, uh, uh, for the possible influx of, of folks uh, that could be that, that could be coming here in terms of the, the mass gathering events around RNC in, in August? Mr. Jones, and then if Mr. Baker wants to add anything. So uh, thank you, Mr. Winston. And I, I believe this is one of those items for executive session later on, but your specific question about uh, planning so, as you mentioned earlier, the, the concept is that hello, the, the concept is that um, hey Brooklyn, no, that's not Brooklyn. Is that Brooklyn? <laughs> the, uh, hey Cheyenne, <laughs> I see you now. Uh, the, the the concept is that um, the event that is a much scaled down what we we would call meeting um, would be no bigger than that, and so I think what you're saying is. Um, use common sense what happens if indeed that is larger and more people are coming. Um, there, there is uh, flexibility in terms of what we can do around um, being able to not accommodate that but to be able to address it. I stay in uh, constant communication with uh, Dina as well as Gibby and they also have a health assistant that's um, related to the RNC that provides additional guidance. What we had planned is in my 30-day memo to have a uh, briefing, public briefing on the RNC that would be August 10th, and that would give us an opportunity to talk about not just uh, the, the issues that you've brought up, but to um, show um, how we are dealing with preparedness for that. Um, I, I think there are a couple of things that I think we, we uh, should uh, talk about. Uh, I think we need to understand, you know, in terms of our, our, our excuse me, uh, hospitality industry, if there are any change in the expectations of crowds that are coming. I think, uh, you know, since we are the only physical location, we, um, even though the speeches are not being planned for here, you know, I would imagine that this is the only place that um, they're, they're to protest and, and things like that. So um, as, as we continue on, I think we need to pivot our city uh, uh, and inform them of the realities uh, that we might be facing as we know them. 
especially as we're dealing with this pandemic. Agreed. Thank you. Great point. Okay, the next um, item, Mr. Okay, so, Jones. Okay, so thank you, so uh, Mayor, members of council. So also, under the COVID-19 update um, on the city response and recovery, there was a, a question that um, Councilmember Ash Mira asked, and many of you also asked that there would be a discussion this evening. And what I've done is I've, I've broken it down into three areas. There was a question around ethics and conflicts, a question around uh, transparency of public dollars and CARES funds, and then a question around the process for the public dollars request. And uh, Mayor, if it's fine with you, what, I, what I'd like to do is break those up into three areas. I believe that um, the City Attorney Patrick Baker provided you with um, information over the weekend about the ethics and, and conflicts of interest. I believe earlier today, uh, the mayor, as she put out the different assignments that are related to or the things that have been referred to, referred to committees, there's one that the um, internal auditors had already um, put on his plan, that is to have a review of CARES spending, the funds of that. So not only is the uh, auditor looking at that internal auditor, but that is something that would be reported to the um, Budget and Effectiveness Committee. And then lastly, uh, late last week, uh, ED staff provided information about the process. So if we could, if I could turn it over to Patrick first to address issue one, I believe issue two has been addressed by um, our internal auditor to his work as well as the mayor's referral and then we'll come back to issue three which is the the process for the public dollars request if that's fine with the mayor and council all right mr baker all right um, here we go uh, yesterday evening you should have received a memo from me um, along with a number of attachments in response to Ms. Ajmira's uh, first question about ethics and responsibility, specifically as it relates to city council members um, uh, potentially uh, contracting uh, for city business. I have provided a review of, of this and, and I um, let me let me just be, be clear and I tried to make this as, as clear as I could at, at the outset uh, in looking at your your ethics policy the city attorney uh, has a role in two prongs of the ethics policy uh, the first is in section 3b uh, and I'll just read that into the record uh, if the mayor or a council member believes that his or her actions while legal and ethical may be misunderstood the official should seek the advice of the city attorney and should consider publicly disclosing the facts of the situation and the steps taken to resolve it, such as consulting with the city attorney. And uh, this is a review that, that I've actually done with, with some of you, where you will come to me um, with a particular fact pattern and, uh, and will ask me um, whether or not um, you, you can vote on an item, if it's a, if it's a, a, a council agenda matter, uh, or whether you can participate in a program, attend an event, or, or what have you. Um, you'll give me that information, I'll, I'll ask you some follow-up questions, and then uh, based on that conversation that you and I have, um, I will advise you uh, as to whether or not you can um, you know, accept the invitation, you have to pay uh, out of your own funds for the invitation, or, or whatever the issue is, um, but it's a, a very straightforward sort of informal review um, that you reach out to me uh, and I try to uh, uh, steer you uh, through any uh, potential uh, ethical uh, landmines if, if there are any. Um, the second place that I, uh, the attorney shows up uh, is at the end of your policy as it relates to um, uh, complaints, investigations, and sanctions. Um, and this uh, states essentially uh, that any individual may file a complaint alleging a violation against a city uh, council member. Uh, complaints should be filed with the city clerk's office on a form uh, that's actually on the city clerk's website. Um, uh, and the, cl the complaint shall identify the complainant, state with specificity the facts that form the basis for the alleged violation, and cite the provision that has allegedly uh, been violated. Uh, the clerk would refer that complaint to me, uh, and I would review it simply to check uh, the boxes um, uh, to, to make sure that, that there is a valid complaint here. If something is missing, um, we would reach out to the complainant to advise uh, what is missing in the 
complaint and give the complainant an opportunity uh, to provide uh, the, whatever that, that information is. Once there is a valid complaint, and, and I have determined that it's a valid complaint, and to be clear, that's not a substantive review of the complaint. It is simply a technical review to make sure that the three, blo the three boxes have uh, been checked and that it is a, a valid complaint. Uh, at that point in time, uh, I am instructed uh, to, uh, I shall refer the complaint uh, to an independent investigator selected by uh, me, the city attorney. Um, and and I, I, I tried to make the point at the outset um, that, that I want to make sure everyone understands it is not my role, it's not my responsibility uh, to investigate a council member. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about conflicts of interest. It would certainly be a conflict of interest for me uh, to investigate uh, any of the 12 individuals that employ me in the position uh, that I am in, uh, which is why once there is a complaint, um, that is, um, uh, it is my job to uh, to seek an independent investigator. In this particular matter, um, and I do, I haven't had the opportunity to provide an update uh, since uh, I sent you the memo uh, last night, but I have received, uh, I believe the last count was 13 uh, emails from citizens, I assume they're citizens, uh, asking me to do an investigation into this particular matter. Uh, I have uh, spoken with the city clerk uh, to determine whether or not anyone has, uh, has filed a complaint with the city clerk, uh, and as of two hours ago, uh, and she is shaking her net head no, uh, no one has, uh, has filed a complaint with the clerk, so there's not something in the process. But I will tell you that uh, just in looking at the substance of the emails that I've received, and I believe that some of the uh, uh, emails you have, may have received as well, um, I think that you should assume that there will be an investigation of the subject matter uh, uh, coming forward in the sense that someone will, will uh, I believe that very soon a valid complaint will be uh, in front of my desk that will trigger my responsibility uh, to seek independent uh, investigator to review uh, the, the particular matter. Um, at this stage, uh, Madam Mayor, I, I know that, I don't know if we want to go into the details and there's a, a point in time uh, where one of the council members uh, may seek uh, to be excused uh, from uh, from that portion of the meeting. I don't know if now is the time and if that council member wants to say anything, I'll, I'll take some guidance from you. Is there any vote on anything that, are we taking a vote on anything or is it still? Not at this stage, I'm still discussing it, but I just I just wanted to bring that, if someone okay, will so tell me to stop talking when you when you want me to stop. Uh, so uh, no, I would go ahead that. and continue until, okay. um, do I have any questions so far? All right, hearing no question. I'm sorry, Mr. Newton. I, do you want him to finish, or do you have a question regarding? I, I just had a quick comment, Madam Mayor, and it was regarding the the issue of recusal. Uh -huh. So, it's my understanding it's recusal from the vote, but not necessarily the conversation. I I would imagine because uh, that particular uh, council member and, and potentially other council members might have so might want to explain. Uh, what's going on at the same time other council members might have questions to be directed uh, for explanation from that council member too so i just wanted to 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 maybe make that point that clarification assuming that that the idea of recusal for the conversation is in uh, is in question here um, i'm going to ask the city attorney to address the question of recusal and at what point in um, the conversation i think in, in my memo i pointed out uh, the, the concept of uh, the particular council member uh, either recusing himself, which I believe he's got the authority to do, or at a minimum, uh, the, allow, the city council allowing him to be excused from the portion of the meeting uh, as it relates to any vote on a particular uh, matter. And, and when we get to that point, uh, we, can, we can discuss it uh, at that time. Um, but, but one of those two will, will allow, uh, allow you to go, go forward uh, with that. So once we have, a, I'm gonna ask, you this question just to be clear once we have a motion on the floor for some action that was when, when there will be a decision whether or not there is a reason 
to excuse, excuse. the council member. Absolutely. So until we have that, we're going to continue as is, as you noted. Okay. Okay. okay? Um, I, I have taken some questions from from some of you about uh, uh, this document, the six-page document, and is it an investigation? Um, the, the answer is no, because I I, I don't investigate uh, uh, city council members. Uh, I have called it a Section 3B review. Um, and, and the best way and, and more for uh, explanation for members of the public, uh, if a council member comes to me, and I think the latest uh, question to me related to a, a, a zoning matter, whether a, a council member had to uh, recuse himself uh, of that. As I recall, the issue was uh, that the, rezone, the property that was being rezoned was very close to or maybe even contiguous uh, to the council member's property and, and whether or not uh, that individual needed to uh, recuse himself. Um, and under a 3B review, uh, I would I would take some information. I would ask if it's you know it's a family member um, that, that owns the property. Are you in business with that individual? Do you have a property interest uh, in in the property? And if those answers are no, um, I would say, and I, as I recall, I said uh, that they did not have to recuse themselves from voting. Uh, but they may want to disclose uh, that they're a next-door neighbor of the property uh, when that matter comes up. And as I recall, uh, that council member uh, did just that. Uh, compare and contrast that with an investigation. Um, and if someone decided that they, they wanted to have an investigation into that very matter, um, I wouldn't be asking the questions. It would be an independent investigator, and that investigator would, would go much further than I did in that 3B review, uh, where the, the investigator would, would go to the property owner um, uh, to make sure that there wasn't a, a familial relationship uh, with the, the city, uh, city council member or that, uh, and determine maybe through a, a, a property uh, transaction review, uh, confirm that the individual council member did not have a property interest in the property that was being rezoned. Um, so I'm just using that as an example of the difference between a 3B review and an investigation uh, and what my role is in, in both. Um, where I, I was uh, with this particular review is that based on, on the facts of, of this particular matter, I really focused on two areas, um, and this relates to council members, elected officials, uh, contracting with the city or becoming involved uh, in city contracts. And, uh, and the two areas that I focused on was state law, uh, uh, GS 14.234, uh, and a, a provision in your charter, uh, Article 4, Section 8.101. Uh, these are very specific. Uh, um, uh, pieces of legislation uh, as it relates to the relationship uh, and the benefit uh, that a council member may gain from a particular uh, transaction, and in th these cases, a, a contract. I did the review of uh, 14234 uh, that has a general prohibition that no public officer or employee who is involved in making or administering a contract on behalf of a public agency may derive a direct benefit from the contract. And this, this particular statute is very specific about what direct benefit is. It's not just a general connotation of direct benefit, uh, but in fact it, it is spelled out uh, uh, the public official uh, derives a direct benefit from the contract if the person has a more than 10 percent ownership interest in an entity that is a party to the contract or derives any income or commission directly from the contract or acquires property uh, property interest uh, under uh, the contract. Um, I've had, uh, and in fact I, I identified um, the main sources of facts uh, and information uh, that I received in this uh, 3B review, again, not an investigation, but the 3B uh, review, and spoke to uh, Council Member Bakari, uh, spoke to members of the city administration to get a better understanding of these, this particular program. Um, and Council Member Bakari's, uh, uh, the, the company that he works for, uh, Carolina Fintech, uh, to determine exactly whether there was a contract or a proposed contract. Keep in mind this program hasn't actually been implemented yet, uh, but whether there was a proposed contract uh, between Carolina Fintech, of which Council Member Bakari is the executive director, 
uh, and uh, the city, uh, the answer to that question was no. Um, this particular program uh, involves city funds, well, it's CARES Act funds, federal funds, uh, that are going into the program. Uh, so I ask questions to essentially follow the money. Where is the money going? Is any of this money going to, uh, is going to end up um, in uh, Carolina FinTech's um, uh, accounts, uh, either uh, through, uh, you know, directly through the, from the city to Carolina FinTech, or uh, does it get to Carolina FinTech through some other means, uh, namely uh, another entity that, that's in direct contract with the city uh, to go to Carolina FinTech, and the answer uh, to that was no as well. I also asked Mr. Vicari uh, questions um, just to move a, a little further about whether or not there's a direct benefit, um, uh, the question was whether he had a um, more than 10% ownership interest in uh, uh, CFH, uh, Carolina FinTech Hub, or any other co company or entity that would be in contract uh, with the city, um, and the answer was no. And, uh, and then the question was, would he derive any uh, income or commission uh, directly from uh, his company's participation in the program, and the answer again was no. Um, with that information and also information uh, that was provided by the city, I think you received this Friday afternoon, um, that is essentially a timeline uh, and, and, a, and a much uh, deeper breakdown as to the specifics of this program. Um, uh, in looking at that as well, it did not appear uh, that, that Mr. Vicari's uh, response to me was contradicted in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I have answered the question based on the information that's been provided to me as to whether or not uh, the participation, uh, his participation in this process or his company's participation is a violation of GS 14-234, and my, my response uh, is no. Uh, the second question then goes to now your city charter, uh, specifically Chapter 8, Article 4, Section 8.101, um, and, and that, is, that is an unusual. I haven't seen this language before uh, in, in most uh, ethics policies, but I'll read it into the record uh, as well. Uh, it shall be unlawful for the mayor or any member of council or other officer or employee of the city directly or indirectly to become an independent contractor for work done by the city or to become directly or indirectly financially interested in or receive profits from any purchase by the city. Any such person or persons violating this provision shall be guilty of a class one misdemeanor as well. So very similar, similar in the way uh, to uh, GS 14-234 in, in that uh, it's clear that a direct relationship between a council member uh, and the city, uh, particularly a relationship that's going to uh, bring a financial benefit, uh, is, is prohibited by this section. Uh, but different than 14-234 uh, is this issue of indirectly uh, becoming an independent contractor. The language in, uh, in the state statute speaks specifically to direct. Uh, I don't think you'll find the word indirect uh, in that statute, uh, but in this provision of your charter, it speaks to indirectly uh, becoming an independent contractor um, or uh, directly or indirectly uh, becoming financially interested, uh, receiving profits from any purchase from the city. Um, I was a little concerned with the term indirectly. Uh, that's a, a term when it comes to these uh, ethics policies that, that I'm a little, uh, you don't see very often, uh, namely because uh, they, uh, most ethics policies require a very tight nexus between the benefit uh, that an elected official may receive um, and, uh, and, the, and the organization that, that, that he or she is, uh, is a, um, a board member uh, of. So. I reached out to uh, former Charlotte City Attorney Mac McCarley, who I believe was the actual drafter of this language, and it appears that this uh, language was created uh, during his tenure as uh, city attorney. My question simply was, this is a very specific uh, item, some of which is already covered by state law, some of which isn't, and basically asked him what was the purpose of this indirect uh, the, the, the inclusion of the term indirect into this process as well. Uh, and he gave me the two exa examples uh, that the council at that time uh, was trying to, to address and trying to prohibit. Uh, and this was a case where a council member uh, was uh, sought out to do work 
with a, an independent contractor of the city uh, to do the same work that the independent contractor, the third party, was doing with the city as well. So you essentially had the city engaged with an independent contractor who would have been engaged with the uh, council member to do basically some of the city's work. Uh, and the second case was a situation where a supplier of, uh, I think it was coffee, uh, to the city, uh, there was a question as to whether or not a council member uh, who was also in the coffee selling business could sell coffee to the third party distributor to sell that coffee to uh, the, the city. And, and that was the issue of direct, basically using an intermediary uh, to become financially interested in a contract uh, that the city had. And at that time, uh, that, that, sit, that particular city council wanted to be uh, clear that not only can council members not have a uh, direct uh, benefit um, and directly contract with the city, uh, but they couldn't use a third party intermediary uh, to, to, to be a part of a particular uh, city contract. And, and the words were becoming an independent contractor for work done by the city um, or to uh, receive profits or become financially interested in any purchase uh, by the city. Um, again, you know, with, with this idea of, of, of indirectly, I would argue that the nexus between the subject matter of the relationship between the council member and the third party should be very close, uh, if not identical, to the subject matter of the relationship between the third party and the city. And I cited an example just, just to, to throw out there, a council member whose company provides lawn care services to the property of a firm that provides accounting services to the city would not violate uh, Section 8.101 under that, uh, under my interpretation of the section. However, if a council person is essentially subcontracting with that same accounting firm to provide accounting services to the firm, which would be passed on to the city, and that, um, uh, that individual uh, council member is getting uh, uh, financially uh, benefited from that, that would absolutely be uh, a violation of Section uh, 8101. Uh, again, in, with, with that in mind, um, I did review uh, this particular matter and again asked uh, the, uh, what I believe were the relevant questions about uh, where was the, the CARES Act funding going uh, on behalf of the city. It's my understanding that it will go to an as yet unnamed um, uh, third party payroll um, manager um, who will pay the money, uh, the CARES Act money, directly to the participants in the program, um, and that appears to be where the money stops, um, is that the money goes from the city to the payroll manager to the, uh, to the participants, um, and the participants are receiving a stipend to, to participate in this particular workforce development uh, program. Uh, I asked the question as to whether or not uh, there was an expectation or anticipation uh, that Mr. Bakari uh, and or his firm would, would be in a contractual relationship uh, with that, uh, that third party uh, payroll vendor. The answer was no, uh, he will not be, uh, that firm, his firm will not be providing those payroll services uh, and, and receiving compensation uh, for that um, either. Um, and although I didn't ask the question, I did put in here that I believe uh, that if the money was going to end up with the, uh, the participants and Mr. Bakari's firm was going to charge the participants uh, for their participation in the workforce development program, I believe that would be a problem uh, as well. Um, and, and based on the information that, that I've seen, and I can't recall if I asked Mr. Bakari that or not, but it is my understanding that that money is not being paid uh, and Carolina FinTech Hub is not charging um, for that, uh, that service. So absent a finding uh, or receiving of information uh, that Carolina FinTech Hub uh, is in a contractual relationship with another entity that's in a contractual relationship with the city and they're participating um, in, uh, in that relationship uh, as essentially an independent contractor of the city. And there's no, I don't think there's any uh, purchasing that, that's happening here, um, but, but in the absence of a finding um, of that third party relationship where uh, Mr. Uh, Bakari's firm is, um, is acting as an independent contractor, I have answered the second question as to whether or not there's a violation of section 8.1.01. Um, uh, as uh, in, in the negative as well. 
Uh, and then the third piece was what to do now, uh, and, and, and specifically the issue was if council were to vote on this, could Mr. Bakari uh, be excused uh, from voting on the matter? Uh, and I pointed to uh, section uh, GS160A75, and I'll read that quickly into the record. No member shall be excused from voting except upon matters involving the consideration of the member's own financial interest or official conduct um, in, in, the, in the procedure. In all other cases, a failure to vote by a member who is physically present in the council chamber or who has withdrawn without being excused by a majority vote of the remaining members present shall be recorded as an affirmative vote. Um, in looking at that, uh, I believe that Mr. Bakari could unilaterally uh, recuse himself from, from voting if, if he so chose. Um, but it is unusual to, to, uh, to, to, not, um, uh, to, to not have a specific reason, uh, but I do believe that given this particular case and, uh, and some of the questions revolving around uh, his firm's uh, potential financial interest, I think that would be grounds for recusal. Uh, however, I am going to recommend, uh, just for clarity's sake, um, that the City Council consider allowing Mr. Bakari to be excused at the time of the vote, um, and that would require a majority vote of, of the Council uh, to allow him to be excused from, from voting on the matter, um, and, uh, and then he would return to the meeting uh, after the vote should you decide uh, to take a vote. Um, and that is, uh, that's my report. Happy to answer. Any questions you have? Are there any questions for Mr. Baker? Ms. Watlington? We got some general questions about the Code of Ethics, because if I'm following, that's what we're discussing at this point before we get into specific specifics. So I've got four um, questions, and I will be following up with. Uh, um, series of motions or a single motion, however we want to take it. Um, so please advise as far as that goes. But my first question, uh, city attorney, is can you confirm, or city manager, can you confirm that given that we had already voted on the CARES, uh, CARES Act, Survive and Thrive methodology and funding, ordinarily there would have been no additional action to be taken by council ahead of executing the program? I see that the program was, is set to launch in August, so it sounds like it's already moving. Um, so I just want to understand, on a normal basis, had this issue not been raised, would the council action have already been completed for this matter? Uh, so thank you, Ms. Watlington. So I, I, I guess the best way to answer that is uh, going back to the um, ED memo that you received on Friday, and I don't know mm -hmm. if, if this is a good time to have that discussion because it talks a bit about the, the timeline and it also discusses uh, the fact that uh, there had not been a recommendation um, up until that point. I see Tracy's at the, at the uh, lectern, um, but before that, you know, what, what I would like to do, as I've mentioned to some council members, is that um, at the beginning of this process, um, if you go back and look at the last couple of years, uh, one of the things that we have those four pillars that are in economic development, and I would um, suggest by even the item that you voted on tonight, business recruitment has been a very um, a strength of, of the ED team. Uh, in terms of the two components that are related to the task force with the uh, CARES Act, the small business, it's uh, small business and workforce development, and those were um, two of the areas that the ED team is actually working on to strengthen those uh, pillars, and I'm not sure if we call them pillars now. Um, so it wasn't um, anything odd for uh, Mr. Bakari, who has a level of expertise in FinTech, to bounce ideas off of the ED team or vice versa. So uh, as we started this process, I did ask uh, Council Member Bakari if he would work with the staff to help develop a, a format, if you will, or a program because of the time sensitivity that we had and that um, we were actually a work in progress ourselves in those areas of small business and, and workforce development. So um, what I would like to do, and I did have one request from one of the council members today who's not a 
task force member to get a better idea of what has transpired up to this point because while the task force members have um, a, a good knowledge base some of the other council members this is is somewhat new so what i'd like to do is turn it over to tracy and she'll go over the the memo and i think ms watlington that will help with your question about where we are in the process um okay before you do that because I, I do have quite a i've got four and so i want to i want to do that but i don't want to get too far into a rabbit hole because i'm really just trying to understand the the general process like at this point, was just very quickly, was was is the intent that once we voted on something, it would, because I, what I heard or what I saw in the uh, task force was that the program was is set to start in August. So that means that something's been moving. And so my my fundamental question is, was there going to be an additional council action before it actually started? Is that so I'll what turn, are, I'll turn it over to Tracy. I, I do believe in the write-up. It was um, that based on where we were with the pause, that nothing would occur before some council involvement. But Tracy, I'll okay. turn that over to you if, if that's not accurate. So let me give you some, some background really quickly. And just um, Council Member Watlington, I'll keep it for your question at a very high level. On um, June, I think it was June, there was um, a kind of survive, out of our survive and thrive open for business initiatives. There was something that was brought forward that had, did have support for various initiatives. But recognized was that vote was, was made that these initiatives still have to be built out. And so it's all just access to capital. It's been our intent continuously bring these back for discussion. And so what we initially had attempted to do was to bring this back for discussion, I think on the June 30th task force meeting, um, at which point it got deferred, at which point then we brought it back on July 14th. And that's where the discussion went to where it is, I think started where it is today. So essentially the August timeline that was laid out is not achievable because we've had almost 30 days where nothing has has moved forward on this initiative we brought it with the intent i don't know that it necessarily needed a council action but we did with all of these initiatives because they have to be built out um, because we recognize the level of transparency that needs to come with them we were continuously bringing them back to the task force and that's what we were trying to do on the 30th as well as the 14th okay my next question um relates to the idea that I heard city the, the city attorney mentioned that there were 13 emails that he had received that did not um, result right now in a formal filing for an investigation. I'm sorry, I'm hearing terrible feedback. I just want to pause for a second. Are, is everybody on mute? Because I'm hearing a double back. Okay. Um, so what I want to understand and what I'd like to see change, and I'll bring this up in my motion, is I think it should be a lot more intuitive um, and user-friendly for folks to be able to request investigations. I don't think that it's reasonable to expect that uh, a citizen would know that and in, that in order to launch an investigation, a specific form needs to be requested from the city clerk, needs to be filled out, and all of that. I think that in this day and age, it is reasonable to expect that some form of email um, generates or creates that need for an investigation. So I'd like to see us do some updating to our code of ethics policy in that regard. Um, the third thing is when we talk about disclosure and the code of ethics, and maybe Mr. Attorney, you can speak to this a little bit more if necessary, but in regards to section 3B, uh, where it talks about a uh, council member, if they believe that while what they're doing is legal and ethical, uh, but it may create a uh, misunderstanding that they should come talk to the attorney. I think we should be more prescriptive. If you're involved in any way in city business, you need to go speak to the attorney. I think because otherwise it's leaving it up to interpretation, whereas one person may think, well, this is really straightforward. There's no reason that anybody would misunderstand this. And then we end up further down the line um, in a situation we don't want to be in. So I think that we need to 
we need to make some updates to make that language more prescriptive. And then the last thing, um, you mentioned it already, Mr. Attorney, about the indirect benefits piece. And I just want to read into the record with a little bit of what a constituent emailed us um, and asked about how this, how this is interpreted. Um, it says here, in his interview, Bakari states that to supplement the CARES Act money, private organizations will provide overhead money or some asset value to Carolina FinTech Hub. Overhead money in this case will no doubt cover payment to council member Bakari's associates and possibly himself to do the training and administrative work associated with the training. Further, overhead money will no doubt be used to assist council, members Bakari, council member Bakari's organization in paying facility costs, et cetera. Still further, Carolina FinTech Hub stands to receive publicity for providing this training and would certainly be able to use it in the company's profile to garner future business. Whether or not the specifics of the assertions are true is not my concern right now at this moment. My concern is why or how do we not interpret indirect benefits in that particular way? So the, the indirect benefits only comes up in your charter provision. Um, and, and again, in, in looking, in, in looking, it's green. Can you hear me? Is the city attorney still there? Yeah, I think that's for the city attorney. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, so again, um, the issue of indirect only shows up in your charter provision, not in the state law provision, mm -hmm. um, and right. that that is why I did seek um, uh, some uh, some uh, advice or or at least a better understanding from uh, the individual who actually uh, drafted the document to find out what indirect means, um, and based on on the wording of the. Um, of the provision um, uh, 8.101 uh, and my understanding of the, the rationale behind it, um, I have taken, uh, I, I'm taking a narrow um, view of, of what indirect means. Uh, and that indirect meaning uh, that again, you, you have become effectively an independent contractor of the city through your relationship uh, with another independent contractor of the city, uh, that that is definitely uh, prohibited. Um, you are in the you know you are in the business of selling something um, that is going to get to to the city uh, through a third party uh, is is prohibited, and and that's that is what, where I have stopped on what indirect means is uh, is this idea uh, that you're using another intermediary. It can be two, it can be three, it doesn't matter, but the bottom line is that effectively the city is contracting with you, uh, the, the, a council member, uh, or the city is buying from you, a council member, uh, through these other um, uh, indirect routes uh, is, is, is what I believe uh, the term indirect means. Um, and it certainly makes sense given the, the specific examples uh, that were cited as the basis for the creation of, of that prohibition. Uh, that's, that has why I've come to my, uh, my definition of, of what indirect means. Okay, so absent you being able to actually speak to the person who originally wrote it, it's up to your interpretation, correct? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, lawyers are, you know, lawyers will see things differently, um, uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. So um, oftentimes, particularly in with federal statutes, you'll look to the legislative history, what, what was said uh, during the meetings uh, to get a better understanding as to what they were, uh, what they actually meant. And um, uh, so, so, yes, it was very helpful um, because it would be, you know, if we're going to be talking about indirect, I mean, that can be layers upon layers of, of indirect, and I know that most of these, uh, these particularly, you know, if you're going to have a, a criminal sanction uh, as it relates to it, uh, I think an individual needs to know or should exactly know uh, what activity will, will trip uh, and, and cause uh, criminal liability to uh, uh, to to go to them, and uh, and and that's why I'm I'm more looking at it in a in a narrow light as to what indirect actually means. Okay, so at this time then, I'll go, thank you for that. At this time, I'll go ahead and, uh, Madam Mayor, would you prefer that I make several motions or just one encompassing well, I, them I all? Think, I think right now what we have, the attorney was going to ask questions. I don't have, I can't hear you. 
I'm all right. I, what we the I'd asked for questions for the city attorney on the memos that he provided, and I had other people signed up to speak. But you're perfectly well to make a motion altogether. Um, we'd have to come back after discussion, um, or you can decide to make your motion after others have had their questions addressed. Up to you. Um, I think for the benefit of others, I will. Um, I'll wait. To make sure so that we can make a clean motion one time. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next um, person that I have is Ms. Asmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I thought we'd start out with something fun like CF update, and we'll be talking about electric vehicles. Um, this is certainly not easy. Uh, and so I struggle with this one. Uh, and this is not personal. Uh, so I just want to make this very clear that this is not personal. Uh, on May 11th, I had asked, uh, I had asked Tracy Dodson about potentially leveraging council member Bokari's experience in developing strategy for our workforce development. And, however, I did not ask that the strategy mean that city and reaching our organizations. So this matter is about not about the organization because the organization does great work and I fully support the organization's effort. Uh, instead, this is about transparency, accountability, uh, the public trust and the good stewardship of our public dollars. And I hope that any of my colleagues who would discover this type of information would also ask questions because that's what we are elected to do. Uh, so I have a couple of questions uh, from the presentation that was just provided. So uh, in the memo that City Attorney Baker had sent, Council Member Bukhari responded saying that I have disclosed the details to our task force in real time as we were figuring out the program design over a two month period. And I went back and looked at the task force meeting recordings and didn't find any disclosures. Uh, but again, I'm not the only task force member. Uh, we have some, we had good leaders, Council Member Mitchell and Mayor Potemp. So, Council Member Mitchell and Mayor Pro Tem, are you aware of any disclosure? Uh, I'll speak first. No. Uh, I can't remember if it came to our small business task force. Mayor Pro Tem? No, but I, I know this was discussed in your committee as well, and I'm not on that committee. So, so clearly, um, there was a failure to disclose on Council Member Bukhari's part. So, manager, I have a question for you. Uh, CM, Council Member Bukhari stated in his email to Council that you had asked him to design their economic recovery program, which is fine because you do ask occasionally Council members for the subject matter expertise. Uh, however, did you ask the did you ask him specifically to partner with the city? So, Council Member uh, Ashmere, words mean a lot. And so, what I, I mentioned earlier is that I asked Council Member uh, Bakari to work with the team, to work with the ED department to come up with a um, plan. Um, but your second question was that I specifically ask him what again? To partner with the city. No, I did not. Okay. When were you made aware of the partnership? So I think that's probably one of the um, difficult things with trying to pull all of this together is that there were a few things going on at the same time. And one thing that was happening was, as my understanding, is that um, we had staff, ED staff, working with staff that were doing workforce development for the CELC. Uh, we also uh, came to my attention that Councilman uh, Bakari had already worked with the CLC 
for a, a program. And uh, all of that is happening in the background while the task force is talking about different programs. So there are so many starting points uh, that have involvement with city staff, CELC staff that are associated with workforce development, and uh, Councilman Bakari and his work with the CELC. So as we started to go through this, um, what I came to understand is the problem that we have tonight is that there wasn't this communication all the way up through the task force that there was this opportunity for the city and the Carolina FinTech Hub to partner together. And I think that's the, the, the crux of the issue tonight, is that who was made aware of what when, and a lot of this is covered in the um, document that ED provided to the council late last week. So yes, I did have an opportunity to review the document that was presented. Uh, certainly staff knew it before the council members did. Why, didn't council, why did not staff disclose it? So Mr. Jones, you want me to take that one? Sure. So I, I think that, again, I'm gonna go back through the process as, as a whole in the sense that in early June, late May, when council kind of bless the, the survive initiatives, we had to still build out all of these initiatives. And so my team and, and others at the city are working to build out all of these simultaneously. Access to capital was very clearly your first priority. And that's what we were bringing forward in June. Also in the background though, we are building these others, the access, uh, the partners grants. We were transparent with you guys about those and how we were doing them and things like that. This one, when we when we first attempted to bring it back on the 30th of June, was our first attempt to lay out this is how the program is. We have done no contracts. We haven't done anything. This was just our first attempt on this initiative to say, here's what we have and let you all know what the partners were and what the structure that we were looking at. So I understand it was first attempt, but why wasn't, why wasn't task force why was there was, why was there no disclosure um, prior to you all moving forward? And I, I will quote here uh, in the task force. Uh, how, let me just pull that up here. So during July 14th meeting, I asked Emily Cantero if there would be any ask for council to approve this program. And she stated, quote, so there currently is no ask to council as this is a strategy you have already approved and we are in the process of executing. So what I see is a failure to disclose not only on council member Bukhari's part, but also on staff's part. So the question I have next one for attorney, should the city council consider new rules requiring both city staff, council members and mayor to disclose possible conflicts of interest to your office immediately, not an informal process, but a formal process to make this a mandatory step? So ultimately, that's a, I, I hate to kick that question back to you. Um, I, I would say this uh, for, for the administration, for, uh, for, for my 12 bosses, uh, any time there's going to be an issue uh, that relates to potential ethical issues, I can do a lot more good for you the sooner I hear something um, than, than sort of as we get you know deep, deep into the process and try to make myself available to you uh, as, as much as I can. Uh, I know that, that at times uh, council members and the administration have come, uh, and, and it's part of the routine uh, practice that we have uh, in terms of our, of our relationship with you because it is my, my job and my team's job uh, to, to steer uh, the organization and the council members um, you know, through some of the, 
the choppy waters that can exist out there uh, legally, and we certainly want to make sure that we're, we're doing our jobs. So, so the sooner we're involved in that, um, uh, the better. I don't know how much more formal it can be um, because it's always going to be. I mean, you, there has to be that sort of light that goes off um, uh, in your in your mind that says, you know, I should probably call Patrick on this one and see what he's got to say about that. Um, I don't know if putting that in a uh, in a mandatory document or not gets you there because uh, it's still going to be uh, one of those those situations where an individual is going to have to come to the realization that at some point in time, preferably early on, um, that they should probably seek legal counsel uh, on this before they go too much uh, sooner. Uh, but, but again, anything that can be done to get that conversation happening uh, between uh, my office and the administration or counsel, uh, I think is, um, is a good thing. So I understand the earlier that you know, the better it is for everyone, for all of us, so that we don't have to have this difficult conversation. This is not easy for me. This is not easy for any one of us. So I applaud Council Member Watlington to go first, because um, it takes a lot of courage to go first and ask questions. Uh, so in the process that I know that uh, my colleagues will make a motion, but I recommend that we make this process more formal where city attorney has an opportunity to help council members early on uh, so that we are not in this situation ever again. Uh, uh, attorney, uh, I appreciate your review as it relates to city's contribution of $1.5 million to participants. Uh, have you reviewed the entire transaction of $6.5 million uh, what would $5 million pay for in the overhead? I understand that you do not do investigation. You're only reviewing the information that is provided to you. So I'm wondering if any information was provided to you about $5 million private uh, sector match or private sector donations. I did not get into the private sector donations. Um, my focus was really on uh, the CARES Act funding. And, uh, and where that was going and the contracts that the city uh, would uh, uh, propose to be entered into uh, with that money. So the answer to your question is no. I, I did not get into the, the remaining $5 million. So, you know, as a CPA, my question is always, whenever there is money, the question is, how does that being, how is that being reflected on organization's income statement and balance sheet. So without knowing that information, Mr. Baker, how did you arrive at your decision or recommendation, I should say, that there is no conflict of interest? So again, getting back to my very basic example of the difference between uh, the 3B review and the um, uh, a, 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 an actual investigation, uh, and using using that example, if, if a council member tells me uh, that they don't have a property interest uh, in the uh, the matter that's being rezoned, uh, then I'm going to take them at their word. Um, if they tell me that uh, the, the the entity that's in front of them is not a family member, I'm going to take them at their their word. Um, and and I I believe uh, and Council Member Carr and I had a number of conversations. Uh, where I asked a number of questions, uh, and, and I'm, I know, um, at least in my opinion, uh, based on uh, the seriousness of the matter, that, that he understood uh, what I was asking, uh, which is basically how does does Carolina FinTech's uh, participation in this program, where how does the money get to you? Uh, if you didn't, if I, I think I asked him the question, if you if you didn't do this program and walked away completely, uh, you know, how much money would you lose? How much money would your firm lose uh, versus if you stuck in it? Uh, and the answer was there was no difference uh, in terms of the dollars uh, from the city uh, getting uh, to to his uh, to his company. Um, so with that information, uh, that's uh, and, and for all the reasons that I set out. In, uh, in, in the process, uh, that's, that's why I arrived at the conclusions that I did. So, Mr. Baker, I understand that your recommendation was based on the information that was provided to you by Council Member Bukhari. However, there is a lack of transparency here uh, 
there were several uh, there were several uh, business leaders who served on our small business task force, and they had they also had raised the issue of lack of transparency as to as to how the five million dollar is being spent and how the organization is using those resources. So there is clearly lack of transparency here. Um, what I continue to hear is that you don't have the whole picture of this transaction. So, so is it fair to say that your recommendation may not be comprehensive and accurate? You know, again, use, using that example, if a council member comes to me and says, I don't have any uh, personal interest in, in the transaction uh, that's in front of me, I'm going to say you don't need to recuse yourself. If it turns out that they do have a personal interest, then there's a problem. Uh, and that's where the, under the 3B review, I am dependent upon the information. You're seeking me out to get advice on what to do. Uh, I would have to assume that you're going to give me the information that I need or that we can have that conversation uh, where you know what I, what I need um, because you're, you're trying to steer clear uh, of any issues. So, so in that regard, I'm going to take you at your word for it. Uh, again, I don't do investigations uh, of my, my bosses, but when my bosses come to me seeking consultation, I would assume they're going to give me the, the facts that are causing them concern enough to reach out and have that conversation uh, with, with me in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Baker. So, uh, Mr. Manager, why do we not have any level of detail on who, who the partnering organizations are on this program, details on how much and how they are contributing, and why would you or your staff recommend this program without the full transparency? So, uh, Councilmember Edgemere, again, if I understand what the, how the process was going, at the July, I believe, 14th task force meeting is when the topic was being discussed and the opportunity to have that level of discussion, as well as going back to the memo that you received uh, late last week, was that um, the team, the ED team, was using that time to vet the program or vet the programs. It seems that there were four different programs that they had considered during this time. And you're, the questions that you raise are very, very good questions. Those questions were also raised, my understanding, at the uh, July 14th uh, task force meeting. And uh, that would be a part of the, of the vetting process, yes. What I would like to see is that proposals are not brought forward to council without the full disclosure and full vetting of who the organizations are partnering organizations, where the money is going, um, and how much each organization is contributing, because all of that information is so crucial in order for us to make the decision. Um, Um, I want to piggyback uh, off of Council Member Watlington's earlier question, Mr. Baker. Uh, I know in your memo to Council, you had stated that you have received multiple emails from citizens expressing con concerns over the perception of impropriety of the proposed arrangement. Uh, and they have requested the matter to be investigated further. Uh, what was the what was missing from this email? I know that you had gave us the count earlier, uh, but what was missing from this emails to be considered as a complaint? And, and uh, for those that are listening, what do they need to do? And what are the steps that they need to take to process their request for an investigation? So the, the answer to that question rests in Section D1A of your ethics policy, um, and I'll read that uh, again into the record. Complaints, any individual may file a complaint alleging a violation. Complaints shall be filed with the city clerk on a form provided by the city clerk. 
complaint shall state uh, the identi identify the complainant, state with specificity the facts. I've already read uh, the rest of that. So what the, an email to me, and, and I'm, this is a hyper-technical issue, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a forecast that you should expect a valid complaint um, uh, co coming shortly. Um, but, but I have not received anything from the clerk forwarding me a, uh, a complaint filed on, on the form that's on the city clerk's uh, website. Uh, so that's that's really the only thing uh, that's there, and it's just in your policy. Um, and I would let folks know, uh, if, if need be, that you know direct them to uh, the city clerk for the form um, if, if they want to do that. But in terms of the sub subject, I, I will just give you the forecast um, that if they simply cut and paste what they've sent to me and stick it on the city uh, clerk's form and send that to her and she forwards it to me, uh, I believe you will have multiple valid complaints uh, of the same subject matter. So will you or your office, uh, will you be responding to those emails asking for them to contact city clerk's office? I will be forwarding them to the clerk, yes. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, so next question I have is for administration. Um, Mr. Manager, did Council Member Bukhari participate in review drafts of or offer suggestions for wording of the July 22nd staff's recommendation regarding the wind program? Uh, Council Member Ashmer, I, I wouldn't know that. I could um, to ask staff of that question, but I don't get that far into the details of the presentations that come to the different task force. So who would be able to answer that question? I think I, Tracy. I, to, to my knowledge and all the conversations I've gone back with, with my staff, that no, Councilman Vicari was not a part of shaping this. If we go back through the, the various presentations from May 11th to May 12th to the 19th, um, we talked about two different types of career cohorts, um, at which time, once this was approved in May, late May the 26th, we then started to review different um, organizations that could perform the work. Um, and we're coming forward on the first attempt on the 30th to make a recommendation and then um, actually where we actually were able to have our first conversation with you all was the 14th. Um, and so Councilmember Bukhari was not a part of shaping out uh, what we were trying to do. The reason that we targeted um, the advanced technology cohort was because we saw it as a fast growing industry sector um, in our community and a high demand career opportunities. Thank you, Ms. Dotson. <clears throat> Did we consider having Tech Talent South uh, administer this program as they are doing most of the work and they're also providing the training and it would also remove any conflicts? Uh, Tech Talent South, to my understanding, is a, is a for-profit and we had not looked at them um, as a potential um, entity for this. We had considered them for the business accelerator, but again, that because of the order in which we're implementing these, that conversation has not gone any further. We have a team that's only so big and we can only build so many of these at one time. Um, so Tech Talent South was not one of the entities, to my knowledge, um, considered for this. They, my understanding is they can charge up to $20,000 for a boot camp. And so we were more focused on ones that had a lower cost, uh, faster speed to delivery to get people back to work in the jobs. Thank you. So Mr. Manager, what I hear is that we need to do more work here, more due diligence here. Uh, and the last question I have for you, Mr. Manager, is should council member use their position to participate in a program or influence the funding that others did not have an opportunity to do so? It's, uh, so council member Ashmira, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by participate. Um, so if I meant, I'm sorry. 
Okay, let me repeat my question. Should council member use their position to partner with the city in a program or influence the funding that others did not have an opportunity to do so? So I, I think there are a couple of things that the city attorney uh, mentioned tonight in terms of, um, I guess, what would be an ethics issue. I will tell you that as we're talking through this tonight, uh, clearly there's a great level of concern with council members about this process and where we are right now. So um, I, I think that if we do get a chance, I would like to do the third piece of this and have Tracy walk through the process. But uh, in terms of asking for Mr. Bakari's help early on, um, it, it wasn't inconsistent with what I would do if we were doing a financial transaction and I talked to Councilmember Triggs. Um, that I think what you're asking is the depth of his involvement, which is something that's a bit different than asking somebody to help the team pull something together. Exactly. I'm talking about partnership. I'm not talking about leveraging someone's expertise. We often do that with council member Drake's. We even do that with council member Mitchell when it comes to economic development. What I'm asking is a partnership where city and riches are organizations. Yeah. Um, again, as it works with the council member Bakari's a nonprofit. I think that's part of the, the question that's in front of uh, us tonight as a, as a staff and what the council is discussing, discussing, and that is how does this benefit uh, a nonprofit? And part of that is, I believe what you've asked, is from additional due diligence before a recommendation comes back to this council. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank you. Again, this, this has been very difficult, and I'm just disappointed. I'm disappointed in the lack of transparency, accountability, and in this process where one council member almost got away without full disclosure, and staff continues to recommend this program to reward bad behavior. And this business, as usual, for the privileged few, needs to stop now if we truly want to tackle economic mobility crisis in our city. Thank you. All right. Mr. Driggs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I just want to summarize my own thinking here, which is, I think we have a proposal that has merit. We, has, we have an opportunity to create jobs uh, in a relatively short time frame. It's a good program. Uh, we also know that it's not illegal by any current standard. So, uh, but we have a problem, and I think it's a serious problem. And I would summarize it simply as it should have been recognized right at the beginning that the involvement of a member of council of this thing called for uh, full council involvement and a clarification, on, a very public clarification up front. The fact that we got this far before we're having this conversation puts us all in an awkward situation. And I'm struggling with that. And the truth is, any of us on council who wasn't a member of the working group and hasn't been involved in the prior meetings is probably still scrambling, trying to catch up and understand the whole history of this and who the parties are and everything else. So, uh, I don't believe that we could responsibly pass this tonight. I, I think that we would all look bad if we moved ahead in the midst of the questions that are being answered here. Um, I, I don't think that, uh, I hope that we won't entirely throw it out because uh, I think there's something useful there. So I'm kind of in line with the idea that we need to do more work uh, if we're going to give this serious consideration. and. Uh, the other point that uh, has come across from the questions that have been asked, if we look at this through the, the lens of the ethics as reviewed by the city attorney, the truth is we're in uncharted waters. I, I think what he found was there was nothing in our in state law or in our current city charter that tells us we can't do this. And at the same time, I believe most of us are a little uncomfortable right now. 
and and we're in a difficult spot given some of the criticism we heard from the speakers tonight and some of the uh, input that the attorney got which I don't think we can disregard so uh, that suggests to me that maybe we ought to look again at what indirect means and we ought to do some more work on where it is that uh, we feel a line has been crossed in terms of proper ethics. And Mr. Attorney, I would mention to you, you cited the example of a rezoning. And you would advise somebody that in a rezoning situation, uh, based on the circumstances as you saw them, you didn't see a conflict problem for the member. Now, I would point out to you that if the members saw the possibility that the value of their home would be impaired seriously, by the proposal next door, they might well have a financial reason for taking a position. And I don't know whether the rules we have right now properly recognize that, because I'm sure your advice was sound, but I wouldn't like to think that a council member could vote in a rezoning motivated by a concern about the value of their home and not have that reflected in our policies. So uh, I think this whole thing needs more work. I think it needs to be, uh, the work needs to be conducted under a bright light in public. And uh, I think we also should start a process of looking at whether or not the ethics rules we have are sufficient. Because as it stands right now, the fact that it's not illegal doesn't mean that it's necessarily something we want to do. And maybe we can get more clarity around that. Um, I don't, the question of the RFP has been brought up. And I don't know if I understand the transaction well enough, but it, I think the parties to this transaction and the relationships that exist here would be difficult to replicate through a general kind of invitation to propose. So I, I think this is an opportunity we have that is the result of the work of Mr. Bakari and of uh, commitments or uh, engagement by certain parties who would hire these people and I don't think you can rebuild that if you get somebody new to do it. So I'm not sure the RFP is the answer, but I must say that I, I, I share the disappointment that this was not recognized to be something that could be controversial early on and that the whole of council did not have the opportunity uh, to participate in a conversation about it. And I think there are four members of council in that working group and you just cannot proceed on the assumption that you're going to get the, the approval of the entire council um, in, in a situation like this based on the involvement of four of our members. The most they can do is make a recommendation along with the working group to us. At that time, we should get a full briefing and then time should go by and then we should vote. And I, I just feel I'm in an awkward position here. This could be a good thing. I hate to say no. And at the same time, uh, I really can't say yes under these conditions. Thank you. All right, um, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm also a member of the Workforce Task Group, and I was in the May 11th meeting, and I went back and watched it today, and Council Member uh, Mitchell, Ashmere, and myself all applauded this program uh, and this idea, because it's a brilliant idea, but we were never advised that it was Council Member Bakari. Um, Ms. Ashmira asked the question specifically, was Mr. Bakari a part of the uh, development? And the answer was yes, that he was a part of the development of the idea. As, as would be expected for us to lend our expertise, but it was never disclosed that he was um, going to be the recipient of the, and we won't call it a contract because some of us are getting caught up on semantics but that he would be the, the provider. So I have some questions. Um, first one is for Marcus. Marcus, um, we have a timeline, and we know that um, you spoke with Mr. Bakari at the very beginning to talk to him about the, uh, the idea. What follow-up did you receive from Mr. Bakari? Well, a lot of the, um, I'm sorry, so uh, Councilmember Johnson, uh, a lot of the follow-up was things like we have a long way to go. Um, there are, you know, things that we have to work on as a as a team, as a as a staff, in order to get something that that um, could be useful and beneficial to the community. So, 
the feedback was at that level. Okay. Um, the question is for um, Patrick. Patrick, you said something during the, the presentation. Can you clarify one of the things you said that, that there was no direct benefit because you asked Mr. Bakari if if he had more than a 10% interest in Carolina FinTech, and that question might be for Mr. Bakari, but you said something about 10% interest. What did you say about that? So, um, in, and this is the state law, 14234A1, uh, uh, it sets out a, a series of, of, of questions or, or issues that have to be resolved uh, to determine uh, whether or not someone is in violation uh, of this. Um, and a, a public officer, yeah, part, part of the analysis in, includes whether or not the public officer derives a direct benefit uh, from uh, the, the contract. And, and the question is, what does that mean? Because, for instance, if you are, if you are a, a mid-level supervisor with a company uh, that is doing business with the city, uh, does that now uh, recuse you or, 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 or is that company now allowed to participate in a program uh, with with the city, if you're a council member, um, and 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 that's why this particular provision uh, is, is in the contract. Uh, because if you are uh, simply a, a salaried employee uh, and you don't have more than 10% ownership of the corporation that's in front of you, um, or uh, that you you wouldn't derive uh, an income or a bonus uh, by getting uh, the, the, the contract, uh, then it would be determined uh, that you didn't have, uh, you didn't derive a direct benefit uh, from the contract. Um, so I did ask Mr. Uh, Bakari about his uh, uh, ownership interest uh, in Carolina FinTech Hub or any other entity that was a part of the uh, of the, um, of, the, of the program, just to determine whether or not, uh, if the money's not going to, to Carolina FinTech Hub, but it's going to another entity uh, that he has an ownership interest in, uh, for instance, uh, then that's gonna be a problem. Uh, and that was the question that I asked, and the answer uh, uh, to both of those uh, questions uh, was no, as it relates to Carolina FinTech Hub and any other um, uh, entity uh, involved in that particular uh, program. It is my understanding that he is the executive director of Carolina FinTech Hub, but I don't know that he is an owner. I assume that he is not, uh, given the answer that he provided. But you're correct, it is Mr. Bakari uh, that is better suited to answer that question, if it's still a question. Well, can we ask, um, Mr. Bakari, do, do you have more than 10% um, ownership in Wynn or Carolina FinTech? I, I do not. It's a nonprofit organization. Are you the founder? Yes, I'm one of the founders. Okay. All right. So just based on the business structure would be the reason he might not have the the um, the ownership, if that's what you want to call it, but there would be interest. I, I think that that should be considered, Patrick. And also, I, I have a little visual. Uh, so, I don't know if you guys can see this, but there's a $6.5 million package. And $5 million of that is coming from private sector. And $1.5 million is coming from the city. It's a package. So, so how can we say that there was no direct benefit? Um, because the $5 million is going towards the organization. And Patrick, I'm very surprised that you as our city attorney would make a recommendation with, with not the complete picture when we've all been asking for this information since last week. If we relied on your legal recommendation without the complete picture, I mean, that would put us in a very awkward position. So I'd like to ask Tracy, because I've asked this question in writing, was there a formal proposal written uh, from this organization to provide these services? So what, what I'll go back and cover really quickly, I want to clarify one question or comment that you had made earlier that on May 11th, he didn't have a recommendation for a um, provider of this initiative. So I just want everybody to be really clear that it wasn't like we went through a process in May 
with the Survive and Thrive initiatives and had already predetermined um, partners or administrators on these different initiatives or things like that. We are literally, as we've said many times, we're building the plane as we're flying it um, when it relates to some of these initiatives. Well, as I said in um, the task force meeting on the 14th of July um, was that we had um, asked for formal proposals from um, the, the various providers that we had looked at and we had, um, had they still had some questions. Again, we were bringing it forward on the 14th to try to create transparency, understand what more questions were. I had had a conversation with Council Member Bakari a week before that where says, we, we think we have a framework. We need to formalize exactly what this looks like. There had also been some other questions to understand the CELC's participation and things like that. Again, it was ongoing conversations. We were starting on the 14th of July to bring the recommendation forward to you all and start to formalize things. Nothing had been formalized up until that point um, other than a series of conversations between staff, between when, between the CELC to see if this is the initiative we want to move forward with. Okay, it was my understanding watching that meeting um, on the 14th and also from what Emily was saying that, that Wynn was going to be the provider of the advanced technology and that um, there was a provider for the HVAC services. I would ask that the provider of the HVAC services, did they submit a formal proposal? The, the HVAC services, the, the renew aspect of the, of the intensive career cohort was an RFP process because in that particular case, we were looking for a, a, a vendor essentially to do the training for us. And that was a little bit of a different, a different process. So that was um, a, an initiative that we had led and created and we needed to find the vendor. As Council Member Drew pointed out earlier, this initiative around advanced technology was something that was more of a three-way partnership that was discussed um, as we were considering um, when over some of the other partners. Okay, so was that other provider, were their participants going to be mailed stipends directly or was, were the stipends going to come direct, um, directly from the, the provider? And the reason I ask that is, has the city ever had a program where we pay uh, participants directly to attend a training? And, and you can say directly or indirectly, I know we have a third party, but I just find this a unique or extraordinary model, just having been around nonprofits for a long time. It, um, is there any other history where the city has gone to such just such extremes to pay the participants instead of relying on the vendor or the provider to do that? Well, I, I think in this particular case, we were looking at participating with the stipends as a, as, as a program that was in COVID relief and the CARES Act. And so I don't know if we, if the city has um, a past in being a partner like this with an initiative like this, but I also don't know that we've been in this position with the pandemic before um, and money that we were trying to put out into the community to put people back to work um, and provide jobs or small business support and things like that. Okay. And then um, um, I guess my next question is for Patrick. Patrick, I find it so interesting that you were able to contact the, the author of the law to ask for their interpretation. Um, as the 15th largest city uh, in, in the country, I think that we need to be looking at more broad understanding. Um, if you look up indirect versus direct costs or benefits for business, it's actually a, a, a business or a financial term. There's also soft uh, return on investment versus hard return on investment. Um, so I, I'm, I'm concerned that this recommendation was made um, it, from such a closed view. 
And I, I would hope that in the future um, that there would be a more comprehensive view. I, I think if we truly want to uh, break the status quo and, and break these systemic barriers for small businesses, then we have to start looking at things more broadly. You know, the complaint that small businesses and minorities can't get a seat at the table, but if we don't even know, we're not even invited to the the party. We don't even know what's going on. We'll never uh, move, move, uh, or have equity, and, and and change that from being, you know, not upward global in our city. So uh, I think that we were voted um, to be good stewards over public dollars. I, I I don't see, and now I see based on Patrick's review why this is how he can interpret it like that, because maybe you're not familiar with nonprofit terms or business terms. But this is definitely, uh, for, it looks like to me, based on the $5 million, direct benefit, but the indirect benefit from the brand, from the uh, participants, from the exposure, um, is it, definitely an indirect benefit. Any organization whose, whose participants are paid almost $3,000 a month are going to have a line around the, uh, uh, to, of people to attend. So this package, the $6.5 million in marriage, without participants, there's not the program. I think that this program could have been uh, available to any other organization um, if you had put this out there. You mentioned about five organizations, Tracy, um, and reasons why they were not a good fit. If they had been given the opportunity to, for this package, I think they could have done that without this appearance of impropriety. Um, and, and I guess that just brings me to the last questions for Marcus, Tracy, and Patrick. Tracy, do you see this um, as uh, unethical or improper? I have. I will tell you personally, I've been on a lot of boards. I have not served an elected position. Um, you know, we wanted our desire from a staff level was to be transparent with with everyone about this. Um, we were not trying to do something that was un unethical. Um, I, in my heart of hearts, I believed that the program that we were rep representing and the strategy that we were representing moving forward was what was best for our community. Um, I do not, again, feel as though in going back and looking at everything that there was anything that was intentionally kept from council. That was why we were trying to bring it forward. Um, you know, our goal is to be transparent, but as I've said before, we are trying to build this plane on a lot of initiatives very quickly to help our community. And so, you know, I get where council has issues with it, but again, in our heart of hearts, this program was going to produce the most number of jobs, the most number of opportunities for participants with the most jobs at the end in a timely manner. And we were trying to create any separation specifically to the FinTech Hub and WIN for city involvement in that process. So do I think it was unethical? No. Okay, thank you. What about you, Marcus? Do you see this as uh, unethical or appearance of impropriety? Uh, uh, no, Council Member Johnson. I, I don't see this as, as being unethical. I, I do um, look at the $155 million that we received in the CARES Act funding and as I've been thinking through tonight, um, whether it's the um, uh, neighborhoods task force or the um, small business task force, there have been a, a lot of dollars that have been allocated through a bunch of processes, sometimes RFPs, um, sometimes they haven't been RFPs, they've, they've been with partners that we've worked with in the past. You know, one of the things that as I look through the, the write-up is that um, this uh, desire to, to move very quickly, I, I think we lost something there with the desire to move very quickly. You know, there are some other partners that um, the ED staff did um, talk with, um, maybe not directly, but through um, previous relationships. And I don't know exactly um, how all of the CARES Act funds will work themselves out. As a matter of fact, I, stepped out for a moment because there's something floating around 
in the Senate, I believe, that would allow these funds to go past um, December 30th. But I say all that to say that the, I, I think success is um, organizations that are able to help us in this workforce development space, whether it's technology, whether it's green jobs, uh, they should be given an opportunity to participate in what we're trying to do for the city. Okay. And then the last question is for Patrick, and let me qualify it just a little. Patrick, I attended a training on February 27th where you were one of the presenters. Um, and you didn't present this portion, but there was the second half of a whole afternoon of avoiding the appearance of impropriety. And that was with the, Net, the North Carolina League of Municipalities. So would you consider this, now that you know what you know, um, unethical or improper? So I wouldn't use the word unethical. Given the fact okay. that we're having this conversation right now, uh, given the, the, the concerns that have been raised uh, by council, uh, I, I think that, that everybody involved in this uh, would do things differently. Um, I know that, that the administration has been moving fast um, as it relates to uh, th these funds because we're under a, a, a clock to, to get this out into the community um, quickly. And, and I will certainly uh, do everything that I can uh, to make sure that, that we're uh, as involved as we can be to assist the administration and, uh, and the council in, in, in getting, getting through this. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have looked at, 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 the, um, at the language of, of the two provisions, uh, the criminal provisions, and I don't believe uh, that they've been violated uh, here. Um, but, but certainly, you know, just listening to, to, to the conversation, um, I wish that all, all 12 of you were, were on the same page uh, throughout this and uh, will certainly commit to doing what I can uh, to assist that going forward. Okay. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Mayor Botan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so as somebody who had, was on this, is on the Small Business Recovery Task Force, but I'm not on the Workforce Development Committee, I do want to say that um, as, we, as we're trying to figure out what to do for our business community, we're trying to also leverage ways that we can work with the private sector because as we know, my biggest concern with our CARES Act money is that we're, put, we're giving grant money to small businesses, but at the end of the day, if people can't get jobs and people can't get back to work, they're still really stuck. So I think there has been an emphasis on trying to do things that are innovative and, and leverage the private sector uh, and do it quickly. So I hear what you're saying about the need to get this out fast. But I'm also, I also struggle with the fact that frequently the culture, at least on the five years I've been on council, has been to only tell council members what you want them to know. And it's very frustrating to me. It was frustrating on that North Tryon 7th Street vote. It's frustrating here. And I, I said that in the task force meeting. And I had asked questions about this, and I asked questions on different phases of the Thrive program. Who was behind this? And I was rebuffed on some of those answers, and that is frustrating to me. That said, I think that's all getting aired out here tonight. That's a process issue. It's a culture issue. Um, it's a staff issue that, that council members should be able to get the information they asked for. Um, I did ask, I sent a memo to my colleagues saying, please take the time to ask your questions before coming tonight so that we can try to get to a place of understanding. Because at the end of the day, this is a program that is set up to train 70, 80, 90 people who lost jobs because of COVID. And that's important because we cannot use the CARES Act money unless it is for a COVID related purpose. So it is for, for the, to train people who lost their jobs because of COVID and probably aren't gonna go back into those jobs again. And it is to train them in an, in an industry that is a high wage growth industry. Let's not lose sight of that. This has been done before by Carolina FinTech. I didn't know 
you know, previous to all of this, that this really what Carolina FinTech did, to be honest, and I've spent hours in the past week trying to understand this whole thing. Um, it had, the, from what I understand, the cohorts that have gone through this program before were over 80% people of color who had an average income of $22,000, and they were going into jobs that were in $50,000 plus. And please correct me, staff, or Mr. Bakari, if I'm wrong on that information. But so at its core, it's a good program, but the process was very flawed. So I don't want to throw out what could be a good idea if in fact we could take this back to committee, to Mr. Mitchell's committee and say, who else can do this? If there's other groups that are out there that can do that and give a commitment to provide a job to somebody, then absolutely they should come forward and say that. And absolutely we should look at our CARES Act money and see if we can use it that way too. And this one should be in there with that as well. So I, I just, it's a struggle to come up with good private public programs, uh, partnerships that leverage not just the money that we have, but the public, the private sector's money as well. And I think that I, I hope that we can get to a place that, um, yes, we can have this discussion. And if we feel with what we understand now that there has, that our ethics policy does not cover the fact that any one of us, any one of us could directly or indirectly benefit from the work we do on council once we're off of council. Let's be honest about that. And then if you don't, if that's not fair and that's wrong, then let's have that discussion. And that discussion should take place in our budget and effectiveness committee. But there are council members that are related to all sorts of things on this council, including investments in real estate in Charlotte that could be benefiting on any given day from the that we have, from capital improvement plans that we have. I don't remember people recusing themselves because they have investment investments that might benefit from some of the things that we do on council. So if that's a conversation that everybody feels we need to have, I agree with that completely. And let's have that full conversation. And separately, let's have the conversation on this program and, and open the opportunity to anybody else who can bring a program like this to us so that we can leverage our money with private sector dollars to get people jobs because we know this COVID problem is going to get much worse before it's going to get better here in our economy and for our people. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, thank you uh, for some of the comments. I, I'm not going to, I thought you did an extra job articulating them, but I feel like I got to defend a small business task force committee um, on, on some of the conversation because we, work, we really worked hard and was trying to do uh, something special for our community. Councilmember Driggs, you brought up a good point um, about when did the committee first recognize that there was an issue. And it goes back to April. Um, we got a copy of Survive and Thrive, and it had uh, FinTech enlisted for the accelerator program. The Business Journal did an article about it, and there was a conversation between Councilmember Bakari, Mayor Pro Tem, Councilmember Ash, Mayor, and myself at that time in April, that this is a conflict of having a council member who will be awarded uh, a contract without an open process. Um, if you fast forward uh, to July 7th, we deferred the action item. When you look at the PowerPoint spreadsheet that we were given, and we did not vote on it, but it had no reference to the dollar amount. And so we heard from 3.1 million, uh, then fast forward to July 14, when it was presented to us, it was 1.5. I cannot tell you all how many small business task force committee members were texting me during the meeting and said, this does not look good. And so there was a lot of questions, even the small business task force were uncomfortable about the whole program uh, going to FinTech. And so I, I just, I don't want council members to think that we did not do our work. We raised it in April. There was a lively conversation on July 14th. And then I have to give council member Ashma credit. The transparency was, was very upsetting to me because after we did the My Brother Keepers press conference, the mayor and I had a conversation and I shared with the mayor the PowerPoint slide. It did make reference to 90 uh, cohorts that were in the program. It didn't make no reference to dollars. 
And I think it would have been very misleading if we would have a show of hands on July 7th. None of us knew the dollar amount associated on July 7th. So, Council, I don't want in the public, I don't want you to think we were not doing our job. Uh, we had a great task force of corporate America. We had one member part of, and I'm going to butcher the, the acronym, but y'all know that CSLEC, uh, I, I might have butchered it. But we had a member who was part of that, who was giving us guidance, and was also telling us on July 14th some things that made all of us uncomfortable. Uh, I, you know, I can separate the two. I think it's a worthy program for our community. I think we all committed to provide jobs, especially uh, black and brown citizens. But to me, this we ought to keep it simple. This is a clear conflict of interest for any council members to not to go through a public procurement process and be awarded a contract. Uh, we never done it in the past, and being old as dirt, being around here for 18 years, um, we, we, we have never we have never been in a situation. I don't think we need to adopt this policy now. Uh, of this is the new norm because this is the wrong norm. We've had speakers also speak today uh, about this, and I think the worst thing we can do, Council, is kick this can down the road and thinking it's going to get better. We need to take some action tonight. I, Mayor Pro Tem, I don't know where you're making a motion, or Mayor, you want us to wait later on until everybody speaks about it, but I, I think there's some things we need to do on the, on the uh, conflict side, and I agree with Mayor Pro Tem, if you want to see the workforce development, we did have a placeholder for a thrive phase. We can address that, address that tomorrow at 1130. So thank you, Mayor and Council. But I, I just want to make sure you all know that the Small Business Task Force, we did our job. All right. Um, Mr. Eggleston. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Tracy, how many other organizations are there in our community that, I mean, it's, it seems like a majority of council does not want uh, these 90 folks going through a program with Carolina FinTech Hub. How, how many other organizations and what other organizations exist in our community that if the money is not going to them to be part of a Carolina FinTech Hub program, it could go to them being a part of that would accomplish the same goals or objectives here? That was for Ms. Dodson. I'm sorry, I don't know if I said that. So you'll see, um, Councilmember Eggleston, in the information that we sent out, um, that we looked at when we looked at Road to Hire, we looked at UT Charlotte, we looked at Central Piedmont. In addition, there are private sector providers um, that we can look at as as well. Um, so there there are numerous providers, and I think that what we tried to outline in our recommendation that we brought forward. Um, which again was just a recommendation as to why we were recommending that particular, um, why we were recommending when. Uh, and again, as it's been said, half of those of us that are part of this meeting tonight, at least on the elected side, are not members of either the small business task force group or the workforce and business development group. So uh, admittedly, that half of us has had to play catch up because we weren't a part of these conversations. Um, but I will say, having gone back and looked at some of those meetings in light of all of this discussion, I, I'm surprised that uh, in May at the workforce development meeting, there was praise for the program and asks of staff if, it, if staff, if the city would be collaborating with the Carolina FinTech Hub. And the answer that Ms. Dodson gave was absolutely yes, we will. So I, I do wish that more of these questions, I do think that everybody involved uh, could have been more expectant that the optics on this could be problematic and that these questions could be raised by the, those of us that weren't involved in the process all along. But I, I wish that more of that conversation had happened in the task force meeting and the committee meeting at the time instead of what seems, and I, I haven't watched every minute of every one of those meetings, but it seems like there was an understanding that the Carolina FinTech Hub was being engaged as a partner, and there was praise for that concept uh, because they had a turnkey program that could accomplish the objectives. And I do think that there, that 
you know, I need to come to staff's defense at least in, in regards to the fact that there is a timeline on this CARES Act money. So are there lots of organizations that could likely build a program like this over time and accomplish the same good outcomes that the Defense Tech Hubs program does? Undoubtedly. But if they're not turnkey programs that are ready to go now, we would not be able to do that and do it in the time frame that we have to spend these CARES Act dollars. So when this council, myself very much included, repeatedly pushed staff very hard to act and act quickly because there are people who are suffering in our community, people, the people we're talking about here, as Mayor Prince and Meisel said, are people who lost their jobs because of COVID. These people have gone from what was probably you know, a barely living wage type of job or, or maybe a little better than that, and now they have no job. We're trying to put them not only back where they were before, but in a better position for upward mobility. And we told staff to do that quickly. So while I do think that everybody involved could have anticipated that there'd be some of these questions and concerns and we could have jumped ahead of it, uh, I also think that for council to chastise staff too much over the fact that um, we didn't do things perfectly. If you ask our, if we ask our staff as we did to act quickly uh, because of the urgency of the situation, we shouldn't expect that things are gonna be done perfectly. Things are never gonna be done perfectly even in the best of circumstances. But when you're responding to a crisis like what we're dealing with right now, I think it should be the expectation that we're not gonna get it all right. And none of the response to the COVID crisis at a federal, state, or local level has been perfect, uh, nor should anyone expect that any of it could have been perfect. So I do think that staff has worked their asses off to deal with something that no one could have seen coming and no one knew exactly how to react to. And that's exactly what we asked them to do. Um, so they'll get grace from me that everything about it wasn't perfect. Uh, but I do hope that the Small Business Task Force, the Economic Development Committee, and this city council have a plan B here because it's clear that a majority of this council is not going to allow the Carolina FinTech Hub to be the city's partner on this project. So I, I damn sure hope that we've got a plan for those 90 people who are still sitting at home without a job and who are looking for an opportunity to get a hand up. Um, and if we don't have a plan B, then I hope that everybody's prepared to offer some sort of a, a thoughtful response to the 90 people who will continue to sit at home without a job and without an opportunity. Thank you. All right, um, Mr. Newton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this has been a very robust and, and very informative conversation. Um, I, I, I don't have much more to add, just some what I would consider uh, uh, in comparison to, to, to all of my colleagues' com comments would be very basic uh, questions. Uh, the, my first question, I don't know if this one's been answered or not. Uh, there have been current or previous renditions, I believe two uh, renditions of the, the WIND program. Uh, in those renditions, I, I could have sworn, I, I read this in an email uh, that I, I had received. Uh, in those renditions, uh, the, the participants were paid a salary uh, throughout their their uh, their training period. Um, am I am I correct in understanding that? And and I guess my question, so more to the point of my question, um, and, and I'm not sure if I direct this towards towards you, Councilmember Bakari, or if I direct this towards Tracy or whom, but but in the, in that happening previously, who paid that? Uh, was that the partners who paid that? Was that Carolina FinTech? Sure. Um, yeah, that was the Carolina FinTech Hub and the partners that paid it. Um, the way the program works normally is we have an allocated annual budget from our partners that refreshes every November and December in the beginning of our calendar year. And we uh, forecast and program that out for um, staff salaries, for upward mobility hackathons, for the WIND program. And that includes their salaries, the overhead, and then our partners bring the jobs to the table. The problem that existed at this point was um, we already have a cohort for 2020 running right now with 50 people in it. And um, they are being paid by us uh, as well. Um, on our current trajectory with the money that we've allocated and raised over time that we have uh, refreshed every year, 
we wouldn't have been able to do another cohort until February or March of next year. And it would have only been for 50 or 60, maybe 65 people top. Still a very meaningful number, but um, we would have not been able to address the COVID-related impacts on hospitality workers and those in need of upward mobility had we not up the timeline and done two cohorts in one year rather than one. So that's the difference between we normally pay them. However, um, with, when the question was asked, what could we do to make this happen? Um, it had to be a joint public-private relationship and that we kept it above board as much as we possibly could by having the city directly take care of the educational stipends and the private sector would do everything else in our silo and, and, and never the two meet in the middle. So. Uh, I guess two questions, uh, uh, maybe the first one being a point. Uh, so so in previous renditions, it was Carolina FinTech Hub, uh, now uh, maybe in collaboration with other partners, but Carolina FinTech Hub did pay for, at the very least, a portion of those salaries of the folks that, uh, that were engaged in that training process. So the, the salaries or the payments during training, did, did yes. I hear that? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. And what you're saying now is, is that but for the payment of those salaries, uh, for this current uh, rendition or cohort, the the program couldn't occur at all. Right. It, it would. It would. If we didn't strike this partnership and work on it the way we did over the last three months, then it wouldn't have happened in 2020. It wouldn't have been a public-private partnership. It would have maintained a private partnership. Uh, and that would have been all well and good, but we wanted to help as many people as we could now, and that required us to think differently on how it could be um, designed. So I guess I mean I'm I'm going to need a little more I need a little more time personally to wrap my head around uh, all of this, but I I guess my question or, or where uh, my thoughts uh, are, are are drawn is towards uh, the question of of how it, it sounds like the payment from the city uh, to the individuals, you know, personally during the course of the training, uh, it, it's it's something that uh, that otherwise would have been paid at least in some small portion by Carolina's FinTech Hub, and that constitutes a savings. And I'm wondering if that savings, uh, not to say that this was potentially contemplated uh, by by you, Councilmember Bakari, or, or city staff members, but if that that savings could constitute some sort of a, a direct benefit. Um, so, I, so I need to wrap my head around that. But you were saying that that uh, that this wouldn't have happened. So my next question was, would this have ever happened but for um, uh, the city's involvement? Because I think our objective here is to make sure that as many people as possible, the CARES Act dollars, the objective here is to make sure as many people as possible uh, receive uh, training, of people that have been negatively affected. Uh, by COVID, lost jobs, uh, received the training, and, and, and we create as many jobs uh, as possible and placements for as many folks as possible. And it was my understanding because I I, I did read an email from you, uh, uh, Mr. Bakari, about, uh, the, about the program, kind of outlining it all, and at the end uh, saying that you were considering just just walking away from the table. Um, the impression I got was, was that meant that, that you could continue this program without the city's involvement. Um, but you're saying now that that's not the case. Well, no, I wouldn't say it's not the case. I would have said if COVID hadn't happened and the crisis hadn't occurred and we hadn't all had urgency in our minds of what can we do that we weren't gonna do otherwise to help out, I think that what would have very clearly happened is I would have continued and finished the cohort that's right now, that's funded, that they're being paid by our program. And then we would have done our next one in February or March of next year helping a, a huge number of people, and that would have gone forward. In order to do it with urgency, we had to do it in the manner that we've designed and developed and laid out there. And staff still has the ability to choose which routes they go. I have two choices should you guys decide not to do this tonight. I can go back and say, all right, we're just going to go back to the way we do it, or I can scramble and try to figure out ways to make it work in, in just the private sector. And the most likely way to do that is by doing, I mean, it would basically be the exact same thing of you guys just saying, no, we're not gonna move forward, and we do in the private sector, which would be they don't get educational stipends. And I mean, that's the only thing that would change. All their training would pay, would be paid for, 
all, by the private sector. All their job placements of them making $55,000 a year when they graduate the program would be taken care of. The only reason that that just gives me heart palpitations is having worked with this community for many years. When you come into a situation where you have the hardest training of your life to, to, to lift yourself out and have the upward mobility story, and trust me, I know this because I have it myself, you have a lot of distractions. There are a lot of distractions that if you're working two jobs, Uber and Target, and you've got kids or a family to take care of, you have transportation issues, affordable housing, um, health care, food, clothing, um, all those things, um, it, it just sets them up for, for failure. We have a, a 90 percent success rate in the beginning and, and uh, of assessing people that can come in here and we give them wraparound services and 100 percent of them are end up placed because we, we think about the whole picture and all the challenges they're going to have. So, yes, I mean, I, I, I will one way or another, I will have a decision to make tomorrow uh, based on what this body says. Um, but, um, I, you know, I, one thing we'll consider long and hard is do we let them do the program and not give them an educational stipend? And we could decide to do that. It, it, it sounds like a very valuable, uh, very effective, uh, accomplished program. I, uh, I don't know all the specifics, of course. I, I'm, I'm still uh, learning the details here. Um, but ha having said that, I, I just wonder if folks are going to 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 receive those jobs anyway. Um, and, and maybe we're talking about fewer folks, and maybe there's a need for some subsidy uh, there. But I'm just wondering if we're accomplishing the goal of getting as many people placed as possible if we're talking about putting funds towards a program where folks are going to be placed uh, anyways. Um, so uh, uh, maybe that's worthy of some additional conversation. I, I had one final uh, question for, for Tracy. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that, that throughout this process, uh, other organizations uh, had, had been reviewed and considered um, through, I, I guess, two, two potential cohort programs um, were those other organizations, uh, at least as it uh, uh, pertains to the advanced knowledge technology cohort, were those fintech organizations that were you know, that, that were reviewed and considered? Were any of those fintech? That's for Tracy. When you mean fintech, and I'm I'm guessing, um, I think. And specifically, if we go back to the memo that we sent on Friday, the groups that we looked at, uh, Road to Hire technically would be a FinTech because that comes through Red Ventures um, as another example. Um, the other two that we listed out were uh, Central Piedmont and UNC Charlotte. So Road to Hire would be the only other FinTech one that was on our was on our list. Okay, okay, so, so there was one other. I don't know how many uh, fintech groups exist in this space. I, I'm I'm just now learning, uh, so so I wasn't personally uh, aware of uh, of uh, Mr. Bakari's involvement with Carolina Fintech Hub. Um, I, I I guess I had the expectation that um, that that the assumption wouldn't be made that that I would be aware and it would be brought to my attention. I think that's what I'm hearing from my colleagues is we want to make sure that, that that those types of items are brought to our attention and no assumptions uh, are made pertaining to whether or not we already know. Uh, of a uh, colleague's invol involvement with any organization that might be uh, working with or partnering with the uh, with the city, uh, but but to the extent that 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 this has been an open process whereby others could be involved, I just wanted to to know whether uh, you know how many others might have been solicited or spoken to. You're saying that there was one, and that was Red Ventures. Yeah, and and. My understanding of the road to hire program, I mean, there was, there was reasons why we went to where we did, but yes, there was one other um, with road to hire that was a through a FinTech company or has a FinTech background. As I mentioned, the other ones were on the academic side. Thank you. And I have no further questions, um, Madam Mayor. Mr. Winston? Mr. Winston? Sorry. Mr. Winston? All right. I'm, yeah. I know I'm, okay, yeah. good, thank you. I'm, I'm just about to burk out, Mr. Winston, Mr. Winston. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Where are you? I, I got to compose myself now, man. Eliza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Look, I, I, I do not sit on the economic uh, development um, task force. I, I, I sit on the housing recovery task force. Um, but uh, I, I will say that um, the only surprise uh, for me over, over these past couple weeks uh, was that, that this is even a discussion amongst council. Um, I was paying attention to those task force meetings. Um, I saw the discussions that were happening and I started having questions. I did things like talk to Mr. Bakari, uh, talk to Mr. Jones, uh, talk to Ms. Dodson about uh, how do we uh, 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 approach this work, the problems, um, and the solutions uh, that we have been facing? So we've been having a conversation for feels like a couple of hours now, and there have been a lot of fingers pointed. I think the only fingers that need to be pointed are council members at ourselves. Uh, this is a question of governance. This is, as is said, a question of ethics. Staff does not control that. The North Carolina General Assembly does not control that. Our attorneys do not control that our willingness to do the work um, and ask each other questions, talk to one another, and, and figure out how to govern um, is our job. Um, and what we have heard is that has not been done over these past couple of months. Um, so, you know, I have to stand up for our staff, um, our attorneys, um, and my colleagues. Um, you know, I think, you know, th these are conversations. I'm all for having conversations around transparency um, and changing um, uh, 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 governance models so that they are more adapted uh, to the needs of a modern city, um, which right now uh, they are not. Um, but I feel like we have been having a straw man conversation uh, for, for much of the evening um, and, and in the public over the past couple of weeks. I hope we can get past this and I hope we can really concentrate and figure out how to govern the city. Thank you. Thank you. I think everyone has spoken. I know Ms. Watlington wants to make a motion, but before you do that, Ms. Watlington, I, I just like to say something about this. I know how many times I've watched you guys roll your eyes when I say, let's talk about process. I know how many times you've rolled your eyes when I say we need to study something, but there's a reason for process. There's a reason for study, and I'm going to agree with Mr. Winston. There's a reason to think about what your role is in governance. The consistency that we have to have with each other in our roles and responsibilities as council members is absolutely important, and I think we need to take some lessons away from that tonight. The very first thing is that we ought to be able to have very difficult conversations and we need to have honest conversations, but I don't think we've been doing that lately. I've gotten calls individually from people about each one of the issues that you've raised tonight, but I'm not so sure that anyone else has said, let's talk about this together. And even when the opportunity was availed, that let's talk about this together, where people can say, this is what I think or what I think, people did not follow up to do it. And that, to me, sends a signal to this community that we're not working together. And is that the signal that we want to send? send? You know, in, in some ways, I can blame this on COVID-19. But I think all of us have been around long enough to know that this city became great by people making very difficult decisions and acting on them. And if we're going to abdicate that responsibility to each other, we need to be very clear about it. Now, I have great respect for each of you, but sometimes I think about this. Sometimes we want to be the city council, and that means we want to figure out what we want to do. But sometimes I think people want to be a part of administration. They want to figure out the how to what to do. There's probably somewhere a balance in here in the middle, but the idea to be able to point fingers at people to say, well, you didn't do your job and do your job. You know, I remember Governor Martin saying one time, people are pointing fingers outward. They need to first point inward, and we need to point at ourselves. We ought to be able to rely on each other to have a conversation. I think these ideas that come off one-on-one -on -one and, and building the coalitions and the texts that are going on during council meetings are not appropriate for a council that's talking about transparency. To have these conversations one-on-one -on -one and not the biggest lesson, and I've said this to Ms. Ashmira and I've said this to Mr. Bakari, the biggest lesson I learned in life when someone was trying to get me fired 
And they went to my boss to say so, and my boss picked up the phone and called me and said, someone wants to talk about why you shouldn't work here. Come on in, let's talk about it. Now, do you think it was easy to walk down the hall to hear someone criticize your work? But I am grateful every day that I learned that lesson. Talking about people is more important only if you want to find a win in it. If you really want to find a win just for one, you can do that. Talking together, you find a win for all. And that's what we owe this community right now. So we need to start thinking about governance. And I don't know what the action's going to be today. There have been lots of great points raised tonight about, well, do we want to look at our ethics policy? How do we interpret our ethics policy? I would say to you that this is hard work. To jump into it, we are going to have to figure out how to speak with each other and for each other. And we need to be able to rely on each other to speak that with comfort, with comfort and direction and intent. Because I truly believe in positive intent. And that's why we can do this. We can respect each other and get through this. So with that, um, I'm Mayor, going to recognize Mayor, this. Yes? Uh, could I just make a quick comment to that? Yes, Mr. There's Driggs. A role, there's a role here that somebody needs to play that's not being played. And that role is the sort of centralization like a whip does in a larger chamber or something. So what we had here was a situation where there wasn't a person who took ownership of this process and took it upon themselves to be a sort of a clearinghouse. Because when you get 11 people and you figure out how many bilateral conversations it takes for them to get to a point where there's any kind of uh, awareness, a shared awareness of where we are. So this was a role I tried to play on the 7th and Tryon thing. And I don't know who should play it, uh, Mayor, whether it's you, the pro tem, whether it should have been Ms. Dotson. But if we are all left here, especially under COVID, and, and isolated the way we are without the benefit of conversations in the office and so on, then I think it's going to take a proactive effort by somebody. And maybe we can consider that in my committee. But I, I think there needs to be a sort of designation or an understanding that someyone is going to find out what everybody thinks. Well, we I, this meeting tonight I, and I, I would talk. agree with you, Mr. Driggs. And I think that there was there were multiple attempts yes. on this one to right. accomplish that. So it exactly. wasn't that it wasn't tried. Right. And it was just that there was positions laid out. And right. you know, you weren't tr we weren't trying to get to a place where we could have a common understanding. People had taken positions and those positions were set. set. And so that's why I think it was very difficult for anyone that chose, you know, the, the whole dynamic you learn about, are you taking a position or you have an interest in getting to a solution? And those two things weren't, the positions were taken and defined unnecessarily, I think, in some ways by the length of time. If you remember, we were working so hard. I remember being on vacation and talking with Julie and Smudgy about how do we get this program going out? How do we get this money out the door? And one of the things that I really believe is that we were taking too much time trying to figure out process. And that, for me, was a real statement to have to make because we needed to get people who were desperate for these jobs. I've talked to one of our senators. They acknowledge even at the federal level, they made a lot of mistakes in the way that they allocated this money, but the economy was collapsing. You had to get this money out. So we did that for the first phase, and we didn't ask a whole lot of questions. I mean, I will, I'm going to say this. Mr. Jones tried to find someone to do it best and efficiently and get it out of the way. And we never came back to the council and said, will we use this or a competitive process? There are lots of things like this that we didn't practice, but we've had a little bit more time now. And we've had a little bit more time to reflect on what we're trying to do. And there's nothing, I would say, inherently um, bad about this conversation tonight. I think what's inherent to this conversation is that if we don't come out of it with a better way of operating with each other, with um, building the idea that you don't have to like everybody, but you do have to work with everyone because every one of us was elected to serve a common good, which is the city. So I, I agree. I'm not so sure. I think that we have had whips in the past, and many Mayor. people tried to serve as one this time. It just didn't work out. So Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, I want to speak to that because as Mayor Pro Tem, I do see that as my job. And you know, I, and I, I think I said to a couple council members 
that um, when I was calling around, and you know, I think, Matt, you're the only one that I haven't spoken to about this, and I apologize for that because, frankly, it just, this, doing this in COVID, these are one-on-one -on -one phone calls. We don't have the hallway talks anymore, and it's really difficult. I don't know if the public can appreciate that, but we're a council that only knew each other in person for two months before COVID hit us. And now we're all trying to get to know each other and understand each other's values and operate in this environment. But I called council members. I had two, two council members who said, I don't wanna talk about this right now. I'll talk about it on Monday night. I sent everybody an email saying, please, before we put this on the agenda, please let's get information first and ask your questions. Now we've spent how, how long on, the, on this call tonight discussing this, which is fine. This is our only opportunity to all be together to discuss these things. But I, I felt like I did try to take that position and that role and other council members did too. Mr. Mitchell did, Ms. Ashmira did, Mr. Eggleston did, but this is really, really difficult in this environment. And I would ask my colleagues to please pick up the phone and call each other and call staff if there's something that you don't understand and not wait until Monday night because sometimes it just doesn't play out very well. All right, Mr. Bakari. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I've uh, decided to dedicate my entire life over the last three years to improving the Charlotte ecosystem and impacting upward mobility. I believe that if we have the ability to give back to our community, it must be viewed as our civic duty to ourselves. So a colleague has raised questions on the assistance I've provided staff to help our small businesses and workforce recover from this crisis. I've done my best to answer those questions in great, great detail over the last two weeks. I think here are the most important facts to again relay and, and reiterate. I was asked by the city manager to help design Charlotte's economic recovery approach due to my expertise. It became um, immediately clear to me that uh, the process um, had to be a public-private partnership. It, it was the only way uh, for this and other things that we were gonna be able to make a meaningful impact on these massive challenges we were facing on the tight timelines that we sat within. So I was able to identify private sector partners willing to help, and I was in constant communication with the manager and staff throughout this process, providing them ideas and opportunities to consider in everything from workforce solutions to a small business accelerator. But again, these were things they could consider, decide to adopt, and as you've heard from Tracy, we were building this plane as we were flying it because we had that urgency and need uh, backing it. Um, we ended up designing a program that could change the lives in this one program area of 90 people impacted by COVID on what I would only classify as an insane timeline. It was designed to ensure no conflicts of interest occurred. And I came from the private sector in the beginning of my career as a risk and compliance uh, officer. And I'll tell you, I, I know how to design these things very well. And I made sure for the pieces that we could touch, which again, I must emphasize, staff has not yet even pulled the trigger on anything, um, that those controls were in place. Things like the private sector would cover training uh, program and job placement salaries. That's that value we've heard of over 5 million over the next year and a half and over 25 million over the next five years. And the city would deploy the equivalent of $35,000 of annualized salary directly to those undertaking the rigorous training with no involvement or influence by those private sector parties. There'd be no financial benefit to me personally or the FinTech hub. Um, there wouldn't even be a contract between the city and the hub because we viewed it as each taking a separate piece of the problem and addressing it. To Councilman uh, Newton's question earlier, um, what would happen if the city backed out and we decided to move forward? We just continue doing exactly what we're doing and the people wouldn't get a stipend if we didn't change anything on our side. Um, so we approved it in the full council authorizing the staff to continue diligence and design and make their independent decisions based on what they had learned just like we did with the Small Business Access to Capital Program in that same meeting. You might recall we called it the Access to Capital Program because we didn't know at that point if it needed to be a loan or a grant. So the point is we approve things at a high level to authorize staff to do that, just like we authorize the manager to do dozens of, of times a week in this consent agenda. We probably did it, did it a dozen times tonight and don't even realize it. 
I also reviewed the committees and task force meetings over the last three months and found both staff and I presented and provided updates over half a dozen times, specifically talking about the organizations involved. The manager said it himself earlier tonight. How does this benefit my TARC, his organization, or myself, TARC? It doesn't is the answer. If I had never tried to engage, I would have continued on in the cohort I have that is serving 50 people in 2020. In 2021, I would have launched the next cohort at similar or higher numbers. No salaries of any myself or anyone would have changed that we take. No additional prestige would have been gained. It would have, in fact, created significant additional work for me. It was just the right thing to do to step up and try to help the needs of our workforce. Our goal in the FinTech Hub and through programs like WIN is about improving people's lives through comprehensive programming, and the results speak for themselves. In the current cohort, 81% are people of color, 39% are female. The median income uh, is $21,000 when they come into the program a year, many of them supporting families with that. And they have a starting salary of 55,000 when they graduate the six month program and 100% job placement rate for those uh, that graduate. These are unheard of results. And if, if you're asking the question, could other groups have done this? Absolutely not. You can't RFP for something like this because you're asking, I would like to pay people, individuals, $1.5 million in salaries into their pockets. And for that, everyone in the private sector does everything else for free at a value of three, four, five X the return. It literally is a public private partnership. It is not a vendor engagement for an RFP, much like we do with Foundation for the Carolinas and other great groups in town when we need the private sector to come in and match at multiple times our dollars. So the stipends the city would be providing these participants are of critical importance. When you are in need of upward mobility, your day-to-day -day life has many things that can distract you from succeeding at some of the hardest training uh, you've ever undertaken. One of our graduates was living on the streets just six years ago. Another graduate uh, was held back by a felony he had long since paid his debt to society for. There's a person sitting in limbo in the DACA program that was with us, a single mother struggling to survive. I don't view these stats that I highlight for you as just numbers, rather life stories that have been changed and impacted. So in closing, the manager has confirmed he asked me to help design these programs. The city attorney has reviewed the last three months and found there was no violations of policy or conflicts of interest, and city staff and the private sector partners want to move forward even now. I, I really regret that this has happened. It has taken attention away from what's most important. 90 lives that would have been changed forever won't get that chance. I know voting to kill this program will, to some of you, feel like fair retribution for some of the positions I've taken over the last few months. And while I will admittedly be disappointed if we are unable to move forward in helping give 90 people the opportunity for upward mobility through this program, those 90 people are the ones you'd really be hurting. I hope you understand that. You're gonna ultimately agree to limiting those 90 people's opportunities to succeed. It's just too high of a price to pay for the chance to punish one occasionally unlikable colleague. Please, I am begging you all, don't hurt these people. Don't hurt these people. They need us more than ever right now, and I'm going to be fine from this. I'm just gonna be hurt that we didn't get to help them, but I'm gonna be fine, and I can say that with absolute certainty because it's said by the person who knows everything was done above board, farther than above board. I have worked with deep gripping urgency over the last three months alongside our passionate staff. Our staff just deserves so much. They've been put through so much these last two weeks because of this, and it's unfair. And our amazing private sector partners trying to help those in need. I've spent the last two weeks dedicating myself to the work of defending this program and how it has been designed above board so we can change lives going through so much right now during this crisis. Any of you who had real questions or a legitimate concern about how this all occurred, you reached out to me and di directly discussed it, and I responded in detail to every one of you that did that. That was not many of you. I've done everything I can. It's in your hands now. Just know if you decide to do anything to delay this further than tonight, that is the same as voting to kill it. And not just kill it with the FinTech Hub, kill it in general, because that's the whole point. We have three months of 
bone-staking work that we have put into this in order to do something that was almost impossible. If this doesn't happen tonight, it can't go back to a committee to figure out how else to do it because this was the only way we could come up with. We simply don't have any more time in what was already a massive undertaking. It's also important to note that the private sector is watching the actions of this body very closely right now, and they are both confused and concerned. They are asking questions like, is it worth it to enter into public-private partnerships anymore? And from affordable housing to economic development, that can have very, very real impacts to the work we have. Um, we have heard clearly from the attorney that there is no conflict of interest here, but as with everything I have done during my time serving this community, I hold myself to a higher standard. I will recuse myself from this vote tonight and will embrace the decision of this body, whether it's to move forward helping these 90 lives or not. Thank you. Well, I think we first have to get those motions on the floor, and then um, we can determine um, how the recusal works, or the, is, is that the correct, Mr. Baker? So I, I would suggest that the first motion um, be to uh, excuse Councilmember okay, McCarty. Okay, not recuse, excuse. Excuse. All right. Um, motion Madam to Mayor, excuse well, from the pause, vote. pause, excuse me, before that, I haven't even made the motions I was going to make, and they don't require him to recuse himself. <laughs> so, I, I that's just the question sure. that I was asking the attorney, and I think he was airing on this. Uh, you, yeah, I don't know. I was what asking are the coming, question. So. I don't know what. The, that's what I said. I don't. We don't know what the motions are. So the question is, do, do we recuse him bef after the motions are made or before? Depending on the motion. All right. So, Miss Watlington, would you said you had several motions? Um, let's, I do. Hold but on. First, I just let's here. Go ahead, Miss Watlington. Oh. Um. So, firstly, I just. I've sat here and I've listened to quite a bit of conversation. And number one, with all due respect to Councilman Bakar, this is, for me, this is not personal. Um, but I think that anybody who sat here and listened to the discussion that we just had and to the thing that you just covered, if, if nobody can figure out that that's free publicity for FinTech Hub, I don't know what to tell you. You know what I'm saying? I also think that we need to be careful. Well, I, I appreciate your passion. Um, you're not the savior for these 90 people. It's, it's plenty of other programs that folks can be in. So while I absolutely think that what you've done so far is great, but let's, let's, let's be careful not to say that it's your program or bust. These 90 people don't have a future. And maybe that's not what you were trying to articulate, but I just want to make sure we provide some balance there. Um, I don't think 3Ps are in danger. I, don't, I think as long as businesses want to make money and they can get federal dollars or state dollars or local dollars to do it, there's an incentive there. So let's just, let's deal with the issue at hand and not be so hyperbolic about it. I did want to comment on the, the council culture and I wholeheartedly agree with council member Driggs and we need a whip of some kind. Um, he has demonstrated the ability to do that specifically with the seven to try and vote. Cause I'll tell you, I've been on this council for almost eight months now. And despite the comments that folks made about wanting to work together and these kinds of things, most of the time, we're full of sugar, honey, iced tea. And I say that because when people do choose to talk to each other, which is rare, it's usually to try to convince somebody to vote their way or give their position. It's very rarely about getting information. And I think that's for everybody. And so let's, let's to your point, Madam Mayor, let's look at ourselves while we're giving folks advice to be more, more co collaborative. Um, the other thing that's been bothering me a little while since I heard it earlier, maybe I misunderstood, so forgive me if I did, but I thought that Tracy was asked whether or not Mr. Bakari had been a part of the development of the program, and I thought what she said was no, according to her knowledge. That flies in the face of everything that Mr. Jones and Mr. Bakari have already said. And so, again, maybe I misunderstood, but that, for me, is just the continuation of what some of my colleagues have already said tonight, and that there is a lack of transparency, a lack of proactiveness with the forthcomingness with information, particularly out of this department. Going back to Seven to Try On, going back to uh, sufficient visibility and other external negotiations, going back to missing meetings that are on calendars, going back to last minute briefings before ED uh, votes. For me, Mr. Manager, I need to see our workforce and business development department, economic development, whatever you want to call it. I need to see us moving very differently because to date, I've not been impressed with the level of collaboration that for all council members, not one or two um, off to the side. 
working on things. And so let me just say very clearly today that my expectation is that the necessary adjustments are made and that they are immediate and sustained. With that said, I'll move to my motion. And mine are actually about the code of ethics. My motions tonight don't have anything to do <laughs> specifically with Councilmember Bakari. So if somebody else is going to make that motion, you can have at it. But my chief concern coming out of this is the following, and I'll just I'll move I move that we do the following as it relates to code of ethics. I move that we refer to the uh, city attorney to come back with language and options addressing the following. Number one, update our code of ethics to require that any time a 3P or procurement project involves a council member in any way, it must be voted on by the body before it takes action. Number two, that we update the code of ethics to accept emails or some other form from constituents as sufficient to engage for additional information in order to lodge a formal complaint. Mr. Attorney, I know we've already talked about this, but just for the benefit of the others, the, my intent here is that we don't have 13 or 30 email requests for, in, for investigation and yet not launch a complaint because a form wasn't filed with the city clerk. I think we can do better than that in this day and age. Thirdly, I'd like to update our Code of Ethics Section 3B language to reflect the responsibility of counsel to consult to ensure no conflict of interest, regardless of likelihood of potential misunderstanding. And then finally, I'd like, I'd like us to update the language in our city charter and code of ethics to define indirect more specifically to reflect some of the comments that have been made uh, tonight and via uh, email from constituents. Again, I refer back to Ms. Mingo's uh, email that I read into the record earlier. That is my motion. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, Mr. Attorney, Mr. Baker, would you please um, restate the, the actions that you're being asked to take? So I, I have had uh, conversations with Council Member Watlington um, and, and the specific things uh, that, that she is asking for uh, relates to the, um, uh, the, the, the reviewing the policy uh, as it relates to the, the emails um, and and, and coming back to you with language uh, that, that allows uh, a, a, a more streamlined, simple approach uh, to filing uh, complaints. Um, uh, the, the second uh, part that I had was the, um, to, to address the, the portion about uh, indirect um, and, and what that actually means, and that's in uh, the, the section uh, 8.101. Um, the... Uh, the, the other piece was the, 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 uh, the 3B uh, review uh, and making it more direct in terms of the responsibility that council members have uh, to uh, approach the city attorney uh, as it relates to uh, potential conflicts of interest um, and to get and to we'll, we'll strengthen that language and we'll, we'll work on, on that. And, and the fourth one, which was the first one, and for whatever reason, I can't remember the first one, Ms. Watlington. This is the vote prior sure. to the council members' mm -hmm. acknowledgement before the con before the yes. action is taken. Yes, yes, yes. Anytime a council member is going to be involved uh, in in a transaction in, in involving the city, uh, and I would say regardless of whether there's a violation of, of 234 uh, or 8101, uh, that that be uh, disclosed uh, to the council and have the council be able to uh, separately address and vote on that. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, um, your, is there, you have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Yes, I'd like to make a substitute motion. Who, who is that? Ms. Eisel, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, I would like to make a substitute motion that all issues regarding conflicts of interest in our ethics policy uh, be referred to the Budget and Effectiveness Committee for discussion. Second. So referred to for discussion and re recommendation? Recommendation. So the, the exact same issues that Councilmember Watlington has raised, uh, I would like to refer to the Budget and Effectiveness Committee so that there can be further discussion and analysis of these of any changes with, with recommendations. And that would include the city attorneys. Um, he would have to act as counsel to the committee for, for that issue. So um, I think we, so the real question is um, referral. We have a motion and a second on the substitute motion. All, um, any discussion on the substitute motion? Yes, ma'am. 
Yes, Madam Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, I'm, let me. I, I had Mr. Eggleston and then Mr. Driggs to help me out here tonight. My hand has been up, Mayor. I'm sorry. Who did? Did I get that right, Mr. Eggleston and Mr. Driggs? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Eggleston. Uh, all, all I was going to say, and I think Mayor Pro Tem's motion, if passed, would address this. I was, to, in regards to the city attorney needing to iron out the language for a policy change that we are going to vote on, I was going to express uh, some discomfort on voting on something that we didn't have specific language yet for. So I think the Mayor Pro Tem's motion uh, would address that because it would allow us time to get that specific language, but asking us to vote on a concept without the actual words having been written is problematic, in my opinion. Okay. Well, to be clear, to, I, if I may I, respond to that, Ms. Uh, Madam Mayor, just quickly, uh, to be clear, my motion is about assigning that task to the city attorney. Um, I think that Julie just said the same things that I listed to refer to committee. I, I don't see how that's very different in terms of execution, but just to be clear, my, I'm not asking him to do exactly what, to return to us with exactly what I wrote. I want him to come back with the language associated with it. So not voting on a policy change tonight. Right. I, I think that the question is, does, do you want the city attorney to come back or do you put it in committee and he work with the council members gotcha. as well as okay. doing it? I think that's really the difference. All the yeah, things I'm that were talked I about. she was asking to vote on policy tonight. No, I don't, she didn't say that, yeah. All right, Mr. Driggs. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say uh, there are many angles here. Uh, there's a lot we need to think about. Referring it to the attorney, I think, places uh, an unreasonable burden on the attorney to um, define and respond. And that's why I think a, a committee referral does make sense. And it's not because it's my committee, but I think a lot of work needs to be done on this. And. Uh, I don't know whether embarking on a course where the entire council goes through all of the iterations that would normally occur in a committee uh, to try to reach a conclusion is the answer. I do think the points that Ms. Watlington raised are, are uh, valid. They're not necessarily, it's not necessarily an exclusive list. So uh, it's a question of who this is being referred to. And I think it's more appropriate to refer it to a council committee than to the city attorney. All right, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Okay, Mr. Um, Mitchell. Mayor, thank you. I actually have my hand raised for something else, but I'll go ahead and address this. So, <laughs> well, you can do anything you want to do, so much. <laughs> go well, for I, it. I, I, I'm going to try to be brief, but I see this as a uh, and and not a or. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one, Councilman Wattler to just want input from the city attorney. And I think the motion, though, policy development does rely on the committee. So, uh, somehow, can we just tie both of these motions together instead of voting on one and then voting on the other? One? I think the input the city attorney will have will be effective for Councilman Madrid's uh, committee. I, I think that if um, Ms. Watlington would agree to withdraw her motion or the, um, if you want to put them both together, because Mr. Baker would act as a staff resource to the committee and would cover those things. But I don't want to um, put words in anybody's mouth, and I think that's a decision the council member has to make. Um, so, Mr. Yeah, Graham, I'm, fine with I'm sorry. Uh, did you want to address it now, Ms. Watlington? Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm fine with combining the two. My, what I'm concerned about is that we take some action um, and then it's not six months from now before we come back with it. So I I'm think happy we to take eight uh, months. absorb. <laughs> 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 no, that's right. Why not 12? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, guys. You, you guys, if you, this is, I know this is really important, but I want to remind you, you committed to do August on coming up with the public safe Charlotte plan. A lot of work to be done there. So don't ignore the fact that you've got significant work, especially in the safe communities, but every committee has a charge to come back so that we can have a plan by early September that we can have proposals in front of the public. So I don't mean six months, but I certainly hope that we're looking at what our priorities are and somehow this isn't inside baseball, but also this is something that we need to get done. So I, I'm teasing, but you know, if we say we come back in six months or if Mr. 
if this goes to committee, we're willing to do that. Mr. Driggs can come back and give us an update, and you'll know because we still should be doing updates. And what I hear is there's a need for more communication from committees, and maybe we have to actually go back and start asking the staff to do summaries. We used to do that, but people stopped reading them. So it was really, I'm, well, it's just, I'm just speaking plain. People stopped reading them. So if people are willing to read those summaries, if we say no more than six lines, then we can do that. Maybe we can help get this done. I don't think Mr. Bat Patrick Baker knows how to write six lines in a paper, but we can train, we can work on training him for shorter sentences, shorter word, fewer words. Um, so, um, Ms. Watling has, has withdrawn her um, motion formally. Well, and, no, I didn't want to. With, I, well, I didn't want to. My intent wasn't to withdraw. Combined. I just wanted to accept. Combined. Yeah, I just wanted to combine. Okay, combine. So we have the. Yeah. Okay, we have all issues on ethics referred to the council um, budget and government effectiveness, including those four specifically specific ones noted by Ms. Um, Watlington. And then I have Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham? Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I sat quiet for the last two and a half hours um, purposely um, because sometimes the answer is just right in front of your nose. Um, but I, I wish God would give us favor so we can get beyond COVID-19 because we really need to be around a table talking to one another versus talking at each other. Um, uh, so I, I, I just think we need to be careful um, about the language that we use and uh, what corporations may not do because of this. Um, I, I, I really do. Um, I was in the state senate when Jim Black got arrested and we did this major overhaul on ethics. Uh, and um, I think a lot of people out there uh, today would agree that we probably overreacted uh, in some cases. So I'm just saying that as we go to to um, committee with this, and I think that we should, um, that we need to go with, with it with our eyes wide open and trying to um, hopefully not try to solve a problem that's not, that doesn't exist um, and just deal with the issue on the floor tonight. But, I'll, I'll, I'll walk where you guys want to go. Okay, uh, Mr. Winston. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm, I know we have a. Well, I'm not sure what we have on the table. I thought we have a motion and a counter motion. Uh, well, we now Mayor, have I, a one motion that is stated. I'm going to state it is that we refer the ethics policy um, for well, review. Well, well, I was going to make a total different suggestion. Oh, okay, go for it. This is an issue of governance. Uh, whether, it, whether it be the code of ethics, um, and we already have a work group that is working on this. And as has been said, these are all valid subjects and, and topics to discuss and cover, but it is not a, it, this is not the pantheon um, that we're talking about tonight. And we have to deal with the whole system that we have in place. So I'm, I'm asking you directly, uh, Mayor Lyles, in terms of process, what, do you, what, do you, what wisdom do you see in having this discussion all in all in, in a first Monday meeting or, or something with this governance committee and really kind of put the fire under them that we have to have these conversations now where we can create a framework where we are having discussions around term lengths, salaries, ethics, um, expectations of being in office and all of these things um, at once since we're already doing this. So um, Mr. Winston is referring to the committee that's co-chaired by Cindy Patterson and Amy Peacock. They, are, they were charged with looking at governance um, in terms of um, year, terms of office, um, the length of terms of office, salaries, and um, other um, matters around how we're structured. Um, specifically, they're looking at, you know, the number of districts and at large seats or at large seats in district, whatever, however you want to frame it. But they have committed to do this. Julie, I believe that they're trying to get back to us in October. Is that correct? I think so. I know it's early. I thought it was early fall. Early fall is when they're going to come back. I don't think that they are... Um, are actually sitting around and, and this... I don't think their agenda includes... 
how council works Un or governs. Understood. Understood. Yeah. But what I'm asking is, does this topic, does this discussion tonight kind of shoehorn into that greater discussion and, and decision making that we have on the horizon around governance and how we operate as a council and mayor? I actually think that there's probably a, a, a connection, but not as tangible as one around council behavior once you're elected. Um, I think that, that people all have ideas. As I said, I... We've had, I'm not so sure everybody understands what governance on the city level means. I don't think that people understand the roles and separations of a city attorney, the city manager, the mayor, the council. I, I think it wouldn't be a bad thing to have a, a conversation about that with everyone. But I do think that the ethics policy, um, as, I, as I understand Mr. Graham, and he's correct, Usually when you're dealing with something like this, you want all hands in and you get in there and then all of a sudden you realize that nobody can run for office because you're excluding business people, you're excluding people that have, you know, real depth in the community oftentimes. And so I think it is a conversation that is warranted by the council committee first. That's, that would be my recommendation. I, I think that having the committee come back and talk about um, some of the issues with the full council is a good thing. It could be basically, we could always do kind of a survey, your comments, what do you think is most important to address? But I, I think a committee conversation is the route to take. Thank you. Okay. So um, we, I don't have any other speakers. Um, I do believe, I don't know that we need a motion. If, if there, can, can you just kind of indicate with your hand agreement on refer, the referral and then I'll go ahead and make it. Um, so, uh, Madam Mayor, yes. point of order, the motion is yes. already on the floor, isn't it? I'm asking, all right, it's a substitute motion, so yes, let's go ahead and vote on the substitute motion. All right, let's start. I thought, start. We, combined huh? I thought huh? we combined I thought we combined the two. I am combining it. I'm saying the substitute so, motion was on the floor. I'm now combining it to be everything, yes. So it's just okay. one motion, right? The motion is to refer to the council... Budget and Governance Effective Governments Committee, the Council's Code of Ethics Policy Review in conjunction with the City Attorney with specific focus on updating um, how Council votes prior to, or how Council becomes aware prior around any conflict and action, that we look at, um, look at how we are, make formal complaint more into the digital area, um, that um, how do we make it required for a consult or advised for a consult? Um, and then making sure that our code of ethics has some definition of direct and indirect. Um, with that, let's, um, we have a motion. We had a second. So, um, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Uh, being the committee chair, I'm afraid I'm probably conflicted. <laughs> yes. Yes. I Thank you. You can him. be conflicted, but you're voting yes. Is there anyone that opposes the motion? If anyone, if there's no one, that passes unanimously. All right. So is there any other motion before we move yes. to the rest of the agenda for tonight? And we do have a closed session as well. Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yeah, I, I have a motion that will include uh, when. So uh, should we recuse Council Member Bakari at this time? I make a motion to recuse Mr. Bakari. Excuse. 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 Excuse me. Mr. Mitchell, are you making a motion to excuse Mr. Bakari? Yes. Second. Do I have a second? All in favor of that motion? Um, Aye. I know. I know it's that. Um, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes, ma'am. I'm asking if you support she the motion. Yes, yes. Okay. Mr. Graham? Yes. Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem? Yep. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Is there anyone that is, opposes this motion? All right. The motion passes unanimously. Mr. Bakari, you're excused from this conversation. Thank you. And Mayor. Mr. Driggs, I'm sorry. Well, Mayor, I was... 
I know, but uh, Mr. Driggs, did you want to address the excusing of Mr. Bakari? No, I didn't intend to uh, raise I'm my sorry. hand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just checking in. All right, Mr. Mitchell, you have the floor. Yeah. So, Mayor, I'd like to uh, make a motion that uh, I'm trying to so we, we would not proceed and award a $1.5 million contract to win, but we would take this item and refer to the Workforce Development Committee on Tuesday for, uh, for this program to make sure we, we are training our 90 uh, citizens in the community. Thank okay. I, I'm, I want to make sure I understand. You would not do it with WIN. You're excluding WIN from the process, but you would develop a program for 90 people to be trained. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the motion's clear, okay? Can I, I, Ms. I, 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 I sort of heard a second. Who made the second? I seconded it. All Mayor. right, if, Ms. Mayor Pro Tem. I'm sorry, just for clarification. So you, are you saying that, that Mr. Bakari's program would not be eligible for consideration, even in the discussion in the, um, at the committee level? Yes, ma'am, Mayor Pro Tem. That's what I understood it. It was to exclude him. Um, exclude the organization, Carolina FinTech Hub, I'm assuming that's what you mean. Um, Correct. So would that exclude them from the stipend? That would include all any any relationship with, okay, any relationship. Mr. Baker's saying yes. All right, discussion. Mayor. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Yes, ma'am. All right, Mr. Eggleston? Um. I don't know if it's necessary to explicitly exclude them because it's clear that a majority of council does not want to go that direction, assuming that there's another viable option. Um, I hope there's another viable option and I hope that the action that's taken subsequent to this motion will be as urgent as the action we asked staff to take a couple months ago because in the meantime, there's still 90 people sitting at home without their job looking for an opportunity. So. Um, to me, in case you come to find that there's not another turnkey viable alternative, I don't know why you'd take one that we know is off the table. I assume that if council at any point now would consider the FinTech Hub as a potential partner, it would be with the full knowledge of all of what we've discussed, and it would be because there's not another viable option. Um, so to, otherwise, I don't imagine that six people on this council are going to vote in that direction. So I don't see the need to exclude them by name. Making a substitute motion. Substitute motion, Mr. Driggs. I'm, I'm, I'm offering thoughts if, uh, if the motion making council member is inclined to uh, take them on, then that's fine. If not, we'll vote on it that too. All right, so there's not a substitute motion um, Mr. Eggleston, yes, Mr. Driggs. Um, so uh, I understand the reasoning behind the, uh, uh, the desire in the circumstances to take this away. And I have to say, I'm a little confused by Mr. Bakari's suggestion that if we don't approve this tonight, then it's dead. I really don't know what he meant by that. I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. Um, and in fact, if, if, does staff have an opinion on that? If we don't approve the the, the plan that's under consideration tonight, is it correct that it's gone at that point? So, Mr. Driggs, I'll take the, the first um, shot at it, and then I'll leave it up to the, to the rest of the team. I guess the question is having a program that connects people with jobs. So I'm not sure if this um, specificity of the um, motion creates a very small um, window of opportunity versus if it is um, having a program that connects people with jobs. Staff has looked at four programs up to this point, and the question is would any of the other three be able to do it? So, Mr. Driggs, I guess. Um, in response to what you just said, if the, if the goal is to have something similar in terms of training people and those trained people end up with jobs at um, good salaries, I think that creates more of an opportunity to address it 
than something that's so specific to, um, you know, 90 people and X jobs at X dollars. And, and I hope, um, Mr. Mitchell, you understand what, what I'm suggesting is that I, I would hope you would give as much flexibility for staff to be able to create um, a platform or opportunities for people to have jobs. Yes, sir. So I, I think this is where, again, like I said, you know, our job is what do we want? And then having the staff tell us how to get it. So if what we want is a competitive process where people ha have, that enrolls 90 people, that um, has jobs at the end of it, it's an advanced technology, it's whatever the com I think the motion would be is that there would be a committee that would design the criteria and then you would turn it over to staff to say, and we want to go out on a bid for this. I think that um, I don't know how you go out on a bid and exclude someone. That's the only question I have. And I don't know if you can do that. I think it would be appropriate, given the conversation tonight, to excuse Mr. Um, Bakari. But I don't know what council wants. But I think what Mr. Mitchell is saying is not using, not FinTech would not be eligible to, for a process that the committee would recommend the criteria for a program and ask the manager how to um, provide that program. Is that right, Mr. Mitchell? I got a thumbs up on that. Can you exclude someone from participating? You can decide that you don't. If we can have a conflict, you can. <laughs> yeah, we can decide that we don't want to consider that person. So I think that's what you got, a motion that they will help design something around the techno how they want, what you're studying, how you want the program to be structured, and um, ask the manager to make that happen. That's what I hear Mr. Mitchell saying. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Mayor. Yes, Mayor. sir. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have, a, I have a list. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. I'm Ms. Jackson. I have Mr. Eggerson. Do, uh, do you have any further comment? I, but, again, I agree with the manager. We don't need – I think the meeting is what? In, is, is the meeting tomorrow for this committee? So we're – Yes. So we're – I guess staff hopefully won't need to sleep tonight. We're asking them to have that ready in 15 hours. So I'll be interested to see what they're able to pull together in that time. But I hope that we give them as much flexibility as we can to bring forward a meaningful and, and impactful option. Okay. Mr. Graham. Madam Mayor and Council, I'm, I'm a little bit, this is not our finest moment for sure uh, since I've been here. Um, and, and, if, and I don't think it's job, jobs for the 90 individuals versus the credibility of the council, right? And so uh, in government, even the perception of a conflict is enough. And so I hear the 90 folks, I understand that. I know there's a number of other programs in the community that provide job readiness and and preparing this, maybe not to the extent of uh, the company that we're talking about tonight, but they're out there and we should be approaching them. But I think the job for us tonight is to protect the credibility of the council now and future councils by the perception that a conflict can exist. And so mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm gonna support council members Mitchell's motion uh, not be, and, and, and encourage staff to kind of continue to do the work, uh, but it's because the perception is out there and you cannot take back the bell once it's rung, right? And I think we have a responsibility, yet an obligation um, to ensure to the public um, that everybody is playing above the, uh, above the, above the boat. Well, uh, I, I definitely agree with that. But I don't, so, I just, does Mr. Mitchell's motion conflict with that? I, I just want to go on record things such. Okay, Mr. Newton. I agree with Council Member Graham. Uh, so when I was asking uh, Council Member Vicari some questions, I could have sworn uh, that, that he indicated that the program 
uh, could still, that he would continue with it. it would still, I think that's where his heart is. Uh, and so that's why I, I also have questions pertaining to, to whether or not this is the best way to spend $1.5 million if we're trying to maximize that investment and ensure that as many people as possible receive training, receive jobs. Uh, so uh, having said that, I, I'm supportive of the motion. Okay. Ms. Johnson? Where did I? Thank you. Um, so the bottom line is there's an appearance of impropriety. We as council members cannot be in, in, in the front helping to define a program and then the front of the line as the recipient of any public dollars. It's, I, I can't get beyond that. I will ask if the employers that were so graciously willing to provide jobs, if they would still be willing to provide jobs to work with another partner um, and, and still, still be able to administer this kind of package. If, there's a, if there are other partners in the community that these employers could work with, or if the deal was exclusively for um, the WIN um, organization. So if I, there are employers that would, that would be willing to help design and work with partners out there um, in the community, then we can still keep this moving. You know, we want to keep those. I think it's a brilliant program. The issue is the conflict of interest. Well, so, maybe I'm right. misunderstanding understanding this. I think Mr. Mitchell's motion is that the Workforce and Small Business Committee would design the criteria for a program, talk about who you're trying to serve, and then they, he would turn it over to the manager to implement a process to get bids for it. That's, I thought that's what we were talking about. Am I? Well, what, but what I'm saying is I think the program has already been designed. The council member presented a, a program to the city manager, which seems like it became a public program or it, at that point. So if, if we could go with that model and then maybe just look for pro, uh, providers in the community that could administer it. Because if it's truly, I mean, I don't know if there are private employers that were willing to invest, you know, $5 million or if that was just simply with the WIND program. Those same employers are willing to come to the table and have this $6.5 million package. There are providers out there that could administer this okay. without time. I get it. So we'll ask, they can come and bring in a model like that and it will work. If they do, they do. I got you. Okay, Ms. Johnson, you're done. Ms. Watlington, you're up. Hey, Madam Mayor. <laughs> okay, um, so we have a motion on the floor. All in favor of a motion. I'll start Madam with. Mayor? Yes. Madam Mayor. Uh, yes. I've got my hand up. I'm sorry, I did not see your name, Mr. Driggs. Ms. Jackson walked out of the room. She just fails me every time, okay. right? All right, Mr. Driggs. So uh, I understand Council Member uh, Mitchell's desire to distance ourselves as dramatically as possible from this appearance issue. Uh, I will point out, however, the city attorney has advised us that this is not unethical according to current laws. And for us to exclude it from any further consideration based on ethical concerns, in my mind, prejudges the outcome of the work that the committee is supposed to do. We would be rejecting it based on criteria that are ill-defined, and I don't see why we can't preserve our honor by refusing, by declining to proceed tonight based on the questions that have been raised <clears throat> and relying on the fact that we will turn it down and not look at it any further if on examination these concerns prove to be a good reason not to do it. My concern is that the alternative that we're talking about could take months, a long time to develop, and that some of the uh, design of this thing is actually proprietary. So we're saying, uh, you know what, we worked with this guy sorry, and we came up with this ingenious solution and now what we're going to do is tell him to get lost and shop it around. And I, I don't think that's necessarily the right thing either. I'm very uncomfortable, as I indicated earlier, with how all of this was brought to us. I'm afraid we're in danger of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So I would like to offer the substitute motion 
that we refer it back to the committee without the provision, uh, without prejudging the process by excluding entirely the thing that has been worked on for so long. Is That's there a, a second to your substitute? Second. We have a second. So we all, I think everybody's talked about this, and Ms. Jackson doesn't fail me. I fail her that I am not able to um, keep up with her. So my apologies to Ms. Jackson. So let's go ahead and take a vote on the substitute motion. All right, let's starting um, with Mr. Driggs. A yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Winston. Can we just repeat the motion real quick? I just want to make sure I know what I'm voting. Ref Mr. Driggs, would you, re or, or Ms. Madam Clerk, will you want to read the motion back, please? Oh, so the motion, all right, Mr. Driggs, will you repeat your motion, please? It's basically Mr. Mitchell's motion without the proviso that we exclude uh, the FinTech Cup. So I'm, I'm moving that we refer the question back to committee. Back to the Workforce and business, Small Business Committee yes. and that it not exclude FinTub, that they design a process and it be a return it over to the manager to implement, which is um, by um, some competitive process. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm putting the words in competitive process because I'm, that's what I heard everybody discuss, is that we ought to be talking to people about their qualifications and they should compete for this work. Is that what I heard everybody say? No? Tell me now before... Mr. Mitchell, is that what you meant in your motion? Mayor, um, no. uh, let me be clear. Let me address one thing, Councilman Drake said. My motion was not perceived in making them guilty. My motion was more like Councilman Graham. We're trying to protect the integrity of this city council. It's more of a conflict and not saying he's guilty or anything unethical. So I, I just... I. He, Councilman Driggs, I know he didn't mean to put words in my mouth, but I just want to be clear. It's not saying he's guilty of anything unethical. It's about protecting this council when there's a real conflict of interest. And I'm saying I think we can serve that purpose by not acting tonight on this proposal because of the concerns that have been raised and not, however, at the same time, prejudging the outcome of a review of the ethics involved uh, because I'm concerned that what we come up with instead is going to be greatly inferior. And I don't see why we need to limit ourselves. I think the purpose of demonstrating our concern about ethics is served by not acting on it tonight, without Thank taking you. the extra step of excluding entirely the possibility of looking at this thing again in the context of what other people are able to do. If they come back and tell us they can't do anything, then, then we're, we're left with nothing on which to act. And, and, and not to go back and forth, but I have confidence that we got other providers out there in the community that given an opportunity to train 90 people in technology. Uh, I got confidence that the corporate community would not leave us if we don't do the WIND program. So, Mr. Driggs, you know, I think it's sunshine at 930 at night. I'm just an optimistic person. And so I have more confidence in staff and our community that we can do a program. So, Mr. Mitchell, yeah, I, Mr. I, I, I wanted to um, just make sure you were saying that you would like to see a competitive quality, you know, like we select architects and, and, and that kind of thing, that qualified and competitive process. Got it. Yes. That yes. was, I just wanted to make sure everybody was on board. All right. Ms. Esmeralda, so did mayor, you have your my, hand? Madam Mayor. It's yes, my Mr. Motion, Driggs. Okay. It's my motion. So, uh, I think we need to clarify what my intent was while it's my motion. I understand. I, I do. Uh, and, and I don't know whether that qualification about competitive means that we're going through an RFP process or whether we will simply re-examine the effort that has already been made by the staff to assess the ability of alternate providers, because this has been done. They worked on this and they evaluated the, the timeliness, the cost, and other aspects of what could be done by others. And that's why, again, I'm concerned about the idea that we discard all of that work uh, and commit ourselves to a course that could take months and is, the outcome of which is uncertain. And if Mr. Mitchell is right, we'll end up exactly where he intends uh, at, at no cost. And I do believe the purpose of demonstrating that we are concerned about ethics is served by not voting on this tonight. So I'm, I'm not including that. Right, I'm I understand. This, this, this is a referral. This is a referral to his committee. 
and that his committee will take such action as is needed in order to make a, a new recommendation to the rest of us. Okay. Ms. Asmira, did you have your hand up? Yes, ma'am. I support Mr. Mitchell's motion that's on the floor. Okay. Actually, the, the substitute motion is on the floor right now. Yes, it is yes. the substitute motion that's on the I, floor. There are two motions on the floor. You got substitute motion. What I'm commenting on is that I support Mr. Mitchell's motion. I have full confidence that there are so many organizations that will come forward so that we don't have to have this discussion again and spend four hours on this discussion. I agree with what Mr. Malcolm Graham said. We need to keep this simple and avoid any conflict of interest. And that's why we need to we, we need to exclude WIN program. So let's vote. Again, I go Mr. Driggs for the substitute motion. I'm all in favor. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Whose bell is that? Um, Mr. Yes. Mr. Winston. Yes. All right, Mr. Mitchell. No. Ms. Sajmira. I said no. Okay, I just didn't hear you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem. Did you repeat that? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yes. Um, Mr. Graham. No. Ms. Watlington. No. Ms. Johnson. No. Mr. Newton? No. Okay, the no's, um, the motion fails four to six. All right, we go to the um, original motion for Mr. Um, Mitchell. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> guys, you know we only have about 20 more items to do tonight, so <laughs> you, you guys need to get some coffee. We, I don't know if we even need to take a break, but we're not. Um, even if we need to. Okay, so um, Mr. Mitchell. Yes. Ms. Ajmira. Yes. Um, yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Mr. Newton. Yes. Yes. Um, Mr. Driggs. Under the circumstances, yes. Okay. Um, is there anyone that is opposed to this motion? Mr. No. Winston is opposed. All right. The motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Okay. We are now ready to go to our business agenda. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We have more things on the, I, I you know, the, right. yeah, These can the, wait the manager is saying he's not going to have another report for six months. Um, but it's really regretful because the transportation and transit updates need to come before this council, as well as the CAP and the inclusion report, all important. Um, and I wanted to ask, and when we get to this item, I will ask, when we are having the August 10th meeting, we have some zoning decisions to do and these three reports. And I was wondering if we could start at 3.30 instead of 5 o'clock. So think about that, guys. All right, so let's go to the next item, which is... Um, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Um, this was actually all still under COVID. Is that correct? That's correct. I had one other item that okay. I wanted to ask about. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Driggs and I have had some conversations with the manager, just only because uh, Mr. Driggs is the ASC board chair. We had some conversations with the um, chair. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> is really he the late. chair, Mr. Driggs? Are you the chair? Uh, I just promoted you. It might be <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was going to say congratulations, or Mr. I guess. Mr. Driggs is our representative on the ASC board, and um, he has had conversations, and I have, and Ms. Winston has, and other, I know other council members have, with the arts community about the impact that COVID has had on the arts community. 
and Mr. Jones have said that you believe it might be possible to carve out about a million dollars from our CARES Act allocation to help the arts community. And I would like to ask the council not for a vote right now, but to please consider that we would take a vote in two weeks on allocating a million dollars of our CARES Act money to the Arts and Science Council as a pass through for them to allocate to uh, their arts organizations and possibly have any a different framework that also might um, address other parts of the arts community that we haven't quite figured out yet. Mr. Winston and I have had some conversations and there's more conversations to be had, but I'm, I, I tried to get a hold of council members. Some of you didn't want to discuss it, but until tonight, but I'm asking you to please consider that a million dollars could be used for the arts community from our CARES Act money. And I'm asking if you guys could give consideration to that and any questions you might have, ask Mr. Driggs about it or myself or Mr. Mr. Jones. Thank you. Oh. Hey, do you have to follow up? Yes, please. I have, a, I have a sincere question given the, the past three hours um, of this. Is this a conversation that I can take part in? Um, I have paid my bills for the past 15 years with arts money um, in the Spectrum Center, in Bo, uh, Bojangles Arena, um, in, in the Blumenthal Arena. Um, is this something that I, uh, I am going to be able, that I might potentially directly benefit from uh, because I work in the arts community? Be. Is this something that I will be able to have a conversation about? I think you have to consult the city attorney first step. Um, and I think that um, you need to do that tomorrow um, before you can proceed to have that conversation. And I'm, I'm serious. The whole idea is to talk to the serious. attorney for I'm advice. Because, and I don't think it's appropriate for you to have to explain to us until you talk with him, Mr. Winston. May All right. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Mitchell? Uh, thank you. I just don't want to do a follow-up. Um, so Mayor Pro Tem, or City Manager Ed, um, I guess one for me, what is the balance we left here? What is the balance in the COVID fund? I just want to make sure, I'm a big arts and science uh, supporter, always been, uh, but we have some real important issues in our community. And I just want to make sure we prioritize those uh, if we still have remaining funds. So let me start off the remaining balance. How much do we have city manager of the COVID funds left? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mitchell. So this is um, a, a little bit different. I like to start off this way. Um, back in June, we had uh, $3.5 million that we could charge to FEMA, which freed up additional capacity in the $70 million that you had set aside for us to make sure we dealt with buildings and, and, and um, PPE and things of that nature. So just like we're, we were able to charge some money to FEMA, we now mm -hmm. know that we're going to be, be able to charge another million to FEMA. So that um, cost that is associated with our first responders, um, that's going to just free up a million dollars of a CARES funds. So that's the concept, much like we were able to do um, Wi-Fi and the corridors and the YMCA and My Brother's Keepers. Um, mm -hmm. We now just have a little bit more capacity because we're going to be able to charge at least another million dollars to FEMA as opposed to the CARES Act. So, and, and so it, it's, go ahead, I'm sorry, sorry. Then sp specifically, um, in terms of uh, the two task force that um, don't include the airport. I believe that there's a uh, five million left that's related to um, the um, neighborhoods uh, task force, Mr. Mr. Graham, mm -hmm. as well as another 6.9 million of additional uh, ESG funds that have that have come in, and then I believe on the small business task force. Um, there's 15 million left mm -hmm. there. And then in terms of the, the rest of the city, um, we have that $70 million that's that set aside for some of the infrastructure things and about, I believe, 14 million we had in contingency. 
and, and now things touch that $14 million in contingency. So, so uh, City Manager, then, uh, based on Mayor Pro Tem request, should we then send you additional requests of funding uh, projects to be used for the COVID funds so we can all be transparent? I, I'll, be, I'll be the first one. I didn't keep a balance of how much we had left. And so you're right, I applaud the $2 million for the U, for the Y, for my brother's keeper. Uh, but I think if council members knew there was additional funding still available, uh, you'll see some more priority projects that would be recommended as well. So I don't mind using August 10th, but I think we all need to come back with ways we can spend those funds uh, that are remaining. I, um, this to the full council, um, let me just um, say this. Um, today I had a call with um, Dr. Burtz. Um, there were four other cities on the call, and I would really like for us to um, consider those essential things, um, but the call with um, Dr. Burtz, we're going to have an additional one for Charlotte Mecklenburg, um, mm -hmm. and so the idea of saying we need to set aside some money for the um, um, fall season of what's going on, um, we still have issues around for example, I had actually asked the manager to help look into, as people are going through the eviction process and we're helping them with right, the money for right, rent, right, right. utility charges, we need to talk to Duke Energy and see what they're going to waive on late charges, fees, and all of that. So I'd like for us to consider um, a moment. Um, I think the arts programs are not, we have to look at them just like we look at our other small businesses in some respects. They're part of our hospitality industry and tourism. So I think that this is an appropriate thing, but they are really not getting um, people that, you know, you look at what they were doing and how they helped us build our reputation for tourism city. I think that's an important aspect. And we also have people, a number of needs. So I like the idea of coming back and having a list but I would encourage everyone to be very judicious because we are not over this yet. And I think that we're not getting the help that we're going to, that we would need. Um, we won't know that for a couple of weeks based on what the Senate and the, what the Republicans and the Democrats are debating now. I'm worried about it being 95 degrees, people not mm -hmm. having money to pay their rent, mm -hmm. not money right. to pay Duke Energy right. and our streets. Um, but you know, basically, some of these things might be a little bit easier for us, but mm -hmm. I would really encourage us to be very judicious. But I also believe that people on unemployment, like all of our artists, are very important because they contribute to it just like mm -hmm. we have for small businesses and they're helping their employees. So just keeping that framework in mind, let's not go too far until we get an idea of what fall is going to be like with COVID-19. So those are my thoughts. Um, but I think what Mr. Mitchell is saying is that send the manager, if you've got some ideas of things that you have seen in this community that need to have some adjustment because of COVID, get it in. And I believe arts are there, and I think our utility situation is another one to look at. Yes, um, I have Ms. Johnson and Ms. Ashmira. Um, Council Member Mitchell just said what I was going to say, that, that we do have the priorities. We, we spoke earlier about, you know, the, the tent city, and I know that's homeless, but we also know evictions are going to be increasing. So um, um, I was wondering if the, um, the arts organizations will be eligible for the PPP dollars and small business dollars as well. The PPP uh, from federal government and the small business dollar. So yes, uh, Ms. Councilmember um, uh, Johnson. Audit. Yes, as a matter of fact, um, staff did some research, and some of the arts um, organizations that the city funds have been eligible and have received a PPP. Yes. Okay. All right. I think um, Ms. Ajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
I would like us to look at 10 city and there are so many folks out there that do not have roof over their head. They have not gotten assistance because they don't have permanent housing. So they don't get rent vouchers or they will not get mortgage relief. So we need to look at how we can be part of the solution. I know that homelessness, we often talk about how this is a county issue. However, these residents are in our city and we need to find a solution by working and collaborating with the county to find a solution for these folks rather than just saying this is a county issue. So I hope that we will look at that as a priority as well. I think that's an important consideration and we should work with the county and Anthony Troutman around this issue. So we'll get some information about it um, and start thinking about how we might be supportive. But we have, uh, have already agreed to help with deposit assistance to get people in the hotels. Um, a lot of the tent folks are really, I think what you could call some of the really um, most difficult social cases that we have to deal with and we've got to figure that out. So we'll continue to work with the county and Anthony Troutman who leads that effort for the county to um, see what we can do to work together. Okay, um, anything else under COVID? Madam Mayor, yes, ma'am. This might be um, premature, but I want to make sure I understand uh, Mayor Pro Tem's and I guess Councilmember Winston's idea. Um, you're looking to consider. You want us to consider providing money to the individual artists or to art organizations. The reason I ask the question is because I'm wondering if the artists are eligible for the other funds to meet the same needs, whether it's housing or that kind of thing, or are you wanting them to specifically have funds for their art that wouldn't be included in some of our small business funds? I just want to understand why specifically artists, or not why specifically artists, but how we want to earmark this money that's different from um, the housing or business funds that they may be able to access? Or is it a question of them not being able to access those funds as existing? Well, I, and I'll let Mr. Driggs as the ASC board member speak to that. But in particular, the arts organizations, a lot of them are nonprofits, so they don't qualify for our city small business program. The ones that are for-profit would qualify. Um, individual artists could qualify for unemployment. And so that leaves some of the arts organizations that were, as we know, were already hurting beforehand, um, um, sort of in a gap. And, and I think the other point of it, too, is that I don't know, and maybe some of you all do, but a lot of them, I don't think they can open at all. You know, like a lot of them that had programming had to just stop programming. I know a few of them have tried to find outdoor venues, but they can't really do only 10 people at a show or whatever, you know, the indoor um, restriction is right now. So kind of like our airport concessionaires, their, their um, recovery circumstances a little bit different, uh, their economic circumstances. So a lot of cities, I'm on that um, mayor pro tem call across the country and a lot of large cities have dedicated a portion of the CARES Act funds specifically to arts organizations because they don't fit the, the same profile as a small business or an individual artist. And if Mr. Driggs has had more conversation with the ASC, so he might have, be able to add to that. Uh, I just wanted <clears throat> Mr. to say uh, the, yeah. artists, the, the artists do not qualify for unemployment. So a lot of the artists individually who would benefit from this are not getting anything from anywhere. And I would also just remind you that uh, we have supported, we've provided facility support and uh, uh, operating support uh, from our budget through thick and thin for a long time, even though there were always uh, priorities that we might have considered more urgent, because we just have a, a spread of things that we want to do in government. So um, uh, I, if the council decides that there are more important things to do with this, fine, but this is not some new uh, use that we're talking about. That this is basically an investment that protects uh, an investment we already have and responds to a, a critical sector of our community. Thanks. 
All right. Um, um, Mr. Winston? Yeah, I, I would just, as, as we think about this too, um, not, it's not just artists. I, I would ask Ms. Isold and Mr. Driggs to, to think about this, but it is those of us um, that work in the industry um, that support artists. Um, you have hundreds, um, if not thousands, of stagehands and technicians around um, in Charlotte who are unable to work. We are the folks uh, that set up the shows, the lights, the cameras, uh, the sound, the sets, the trucks, the rigging, and those things. And these are people that are going to be last out of out of uh, to, to be able to come back um, um, to work because as if you're an artist can't play for more than ten people and their entire crews of folks. Um, so I, I would love, uh, and, and they also fall into <clears throat> okay. work, work, um, uh, work uh, 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 excuse me, um, categories and, and, and strange things that, that happen. So I would hope that we're not just looking at artists, but the, um, the, the, the artist supported um, workforces that are really struggling right now. Are y'all 1099 threats so you don't have unemployment benefits? It is, it is a mix. It's a it mix. Is, it's, yeah. It's a mix. And when you're talking about people that work, survive gig to gig, it's how people get it. So, um, gig however, workers, right? It's, but it's, it's even different than you. It, it is kind of tr exactly a gig worker, but it is different than mm -hmm. some of the traditional gig workers that people are, are uh, familiar with. The job markets don't understand it, and governments really do understand this portion of the work. So we're going to ask Ms. the Mayor Pro Tem and Mr. Driggs and Mr. Winston to kind of lay out a plan and have it ready for us um, on August the 10th, earlier than August the 10th, maybe by the time the agenda goes out. All right, so we have a couple of business items to go through, guys. So let's start on item number 10, the um, FY 2021 Governor's Highway Safety Program grant for traffic safety, authorizing the city to accept $25,000 from the Highway Safety Program. Motion to adopt. I have a motion and a second. Second. All right. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Uh, Ms. Ajmira? Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Winston? No. Yes. All right. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Um, Ms. Mr. Watling, I'm sorry, Ms. Watlington. Yes. I think that's six. So, um, are, is there anyone besides Mr. Winston who is a, and opposes this action? All right. Hearing none, it's um, the vote uh, is for with Mr. Winston noted against. Next item is item 11. Sale of the city-owned property on Shopton Road to adopt a resolution improving the sale of 117 acres of city-owned property utilized for the aviation department, uh, located on Shopton Road to East Group Partners for a total of seven million and some change. Motion um, to adopt. So fast. Second. I was like, what? But I know that. What? Second. Nothing. <laughs> okay. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Um, Mr. Newton. Yes. Mr. Ms. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Anyone in opposition to this motion? Hearing no opposition, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, the next item is item 12, authorize the city manager to negotiate and ex execute an infrastructure agreement <laughs> with I'm sorry. With the developers, an amount not to exceed $1.5 million for public infrastructure improvements to build a loop. Reimbursements will be funded by South Park Comprehension Program. Um, yes. Ne Comprehensive Neighborhood Improvement Program. Do I have a motion? Move. Move to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, um, let's start with Mr. Bakari. Back? Yes, he came back. I, he was he voted on the last item. Yes. Yes. All right, Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Mitchell. Yes. Miss Ajmira. Yes. 
Um, is there anyone in opposition to this motion? Hearing no opposition, the motion passes unanimously. Next item, item 13, adopt bond ordinance introduced for 102 million of street bonds, 44 and a half million for neighborhood improvement bonds and 50 million for housing bonds and adopt a resolution setting the general bond obligation bond referendum for November the 3rd, 2020. Is there a motion? So moved. A second? All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All right, Mayor I'm so Pro, I'm sorry. I just want to say I'm excited about this one. Happy to see it. Okay. All right. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Ms. Ashmira. Yes. Mr. Mitchell. Yes. Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Is anyone in opposition? If not, the motion passes unanimously. Um, item 14, stormwater revenue bond, adopt a bond order and resolution that makes certain statements of facts concerning refunding of revenue bond anticipation notes. B, provide for the issuance of stormwater services revenue bonds in an amount not to exceed $116 million to refund the 2018 anticipation note. Authorize city officials to make necessary actions to complete financing, including making the application to the local government commission and adopt a budget ordinance appropriating $116 million to stormwater debt service fund. Do I have a motion so for moved. A through D? Second. We have a motion and a second for A through D. Is there any um, discussion? Hearing no discussion, we'll start with Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Is there anyone in opposition to this item? Hearing no one in opposition, the motion passes unanimously. We'll now do this with water and sewer revenue bond refunding, adopting a bond order and a resolution that makes certain statements of facts concerning the refunding of water, sewer revenue bonds, and revenue bond anticipation notes. Provide for the issuance of water, sewer revenue bonds at an amount not to exceed $450 million to refund outstanding 2009 B revenue bonds and 2018 bond anticipation note. Authorize city officials to take the necessary actions to complete the financing, including making an application to the local government commission and adopt a budget ordinance appropriating $405 million to the Charlotte Revenue Bond Debt, Bond Debt Service Fund. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All right. Hearing no discussion, um, Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell. He, yes. Ms. Esmira? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. All right. Is there anyone who opposes this motion? Hearing no opposition, the motion passes unanimously. Item 16, approve developer agreements with CUSA, NC Holdings, LP and Sweetgrass Bear Wick LLC for traffic signal modifications and adopt a budget ordinance appropriating $184,000 in private developer funds for traffic signal installations and improvements. Do I have a motion? So moved. A second? I need a second. 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 All right. Um, is there any discussion of the motion? Hearing no discussion, um, Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes, indeed. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. All right, is that six? Is there any opposition to this motion? Hearing no opposition, the motion passes unanimously. Agenda item number 17, municipal agreements for NCDOT asset maintenance on state roadways in the city limits. Approve municipal agreements with NCDOT in the amount of $1.175 million for sign installation and maintenance on state maintained streets, pavement marking installation on state maintained streets. All of these are on state main streets. Traffic signal maintenance, traffic signal retiming, and light emitting. I never knew what that stood for. DO, LED traffic signal display replacements. Adopt a resolution to authorize the manager to execute a municipal agreement and any subsequent renewals up for up to five years with NCDOT and adopt a budget ordinance appropriating $300,000 from the North Carolina DOT for LED traffic signal re 
display replacements on state maintained streets. Is there a motion? So moved. All right, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Hearing no discussion, all in favor of the motion. Um, let's start with Mr. Graham. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Ms. Ajmira. Yes. Mr. Mitchell. Yes. Mr. Winston. Yes, for the light emitting diodes. Okay, thank you, diodes. Thank you. All right. Larkin, Mr. Eggleston. Yes. All right. Is there anyone who opposes this this uh, motion? Hearing no one in opposition, the motion passes unanimously. The next item is item 18, resolution to pour, close a portion of the alleyway between 21st and 22nd Street. Adopt a resolution to close that portion. Is there a motion? Move uh, motion. We have a second. Thank you. All right. Um, is there any discussion? Okay, Mr. Eggleston. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. B Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Ms. Iselt? Mr. Driggs? Yes. All right, is there anyone in opposition to this motion? If not, the motion passes unanimously. Item 19, August 2020 City Council All Minute me Meeting Schedule. Approve the August 2020 City Council All Minute Virtual Meeting Regular Meeting Schedule and authorize the clerk or her designee to adjust the August 2020 Council All Minute Virtual Regular Meeting Schedule in accordance with the sta status of North Carolina phase reopening. Um, this is the one that I was hoping that it says that it's supposed to run through. I'm sorry, is this where we're just doing? the motion for August 10th. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that council may be willing to come in because we'll have some zoning decisions on that agenda. And that's all of those, we had a lot of hearings and so there'll be a lot of zoning decisions. And as well, I think that um, in addition to that, if we're gonna talk about some of the things that are coming back for um, the, from the committee's um, work and as well, the um, other issues that we're gonna have, I, I really would wonder if, the council would be willing to start at 3:30. On what day? On August 10th. We should not. We would not be making zoning decisions on August 10th per the schedule that's been laid out. I thought the decisions were on the 10th. So there is a there is a, a decision. That, and Ty, if you need to jump in and, and, and jump in there and talk, but there is a decision that uh, that needs to be made on August 10th from planning. A, a singular decision. To my knowledge, it's to my knowledge is singular. Oh, it's just a single one. Okay, and then the other items. I just um, wonder. Someone from planning is there. Oh, it's Marie. It's Marie. Okay, how many zoning decisions do we have on the tenth? What? Sorry. How yeah, many? Just one. Just one. Yes. Right, Marie, what else do we have on the agenda right now? We have the presentations deferred from tonight, May Madam Mayor, the two, and then the video. And then we also have task for, and this is tentative agenda, not published. Right. Task force com, um, report outs and committee report outs and COVID update. So would you say four o'clock? Would you be willing to start at four? So moved. Uh, we have a motion to start at four o'clock and adopt the resolutions and authorize the clerk as necessary. Um, to, we have a motion and a second. Um, is there any dis further discussion? Uh, May I? Yes, Mr. Mitchell. I just want, if I can, I just want to make sure we're clear. So is this in person meeting or this is still a Zoom meeting? It is still a virtual meeting. Okay. All right. Thank it starts you. Starts at four o'clock. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. So with that, um, Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Mr. Graham? Yes. So is there anyone that is in opposition to the motion to start at four on August the 10th? Hearing no opposition, the motion passes unanimously. All right, so that carries, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think you can hear me. My, my, my vote should be recorded as a no. All right, Ms. Watlington is a no. I'm sorry, I could not hear that. Okay, I have here, 
um, two property items. I think this is left over. I think these are done. So that carries us through our that carries us through our business agenda, our policy agenda, and now it's time to go into closed session. So, um, Mr. Baker, would you please read the motion for the closed session? So I'll need a closed session to discuss matters relating to the location or expansion of industries or other businesses in the area served by the public body. Um, th that's uh, pursuant to NCGS 143-31811A4. I'll also need a closed session to consult with the city attorney uh, in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege and to discuss the matters of English Construction Company versus City of Charlotte and Feltz et al. versus City of Charlotte. Uh, that's pursuant to NCGS 143-31811A3. I'm sorry, do you have two items? For ED? For ED. Yes, one motion but two items. Okay. All right, Move so to we go into closed session. We have a motion and a second, please. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Winston. I uh, just wanted to make sure that um, what we uh, referred to uh, is, as, is uh, in this motion about the RNC. Yes. Um, did you include an RNC? So that'll be included in and then the attorney-client attorney -client client. privilege. Yeah. That's in the attorney attorney-client privilege. Part of the motion, Mr. Winston. Thank you. All right, so do, um, Ms. Mayor Pro Tem, I need some yeses. Yes. So, yes. Put, yep. Ms. Sejmira? Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Winston? <coughs> Mr. Winston? <coughs> Ms. Yes. Mr. Yes. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Washington? <coughs> Okay, is there anyone opposed to the closed session? Hearing none, that motion passes unanimously. Ms. Jackson, how does everybody do this?
So we have to go back. Yes, it was unanimous. <laughs> no, it still comes out on those pay things. They send me an um, email copy. Well, I thought we did too, but it didn't happen. I thought we did. I thought was something had to happen in the budget. Me? What did I do? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Thank you, everybody. We're I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs>